served a better place. So I would ask for a moment of silence. Thank you. We'll now move on with the announcements. Are there any announcements from the uh, school committee? Okay, hearing none. Um, the primary um, item on this evening's agenda is the presentation by the superintendent of the first view FY 2019 budget. Um, you'll note that we have moved public comment period until after the presentation, um, just because we thought it would be helpful to first have him make the, the presentation um, rather than people commenting before uh, they had a chance to see it. So, Superintendent Provost, Dr. Provost, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you and welcome to the FY19 First View budget presentation. As is our tradition, this is not a to the penny budget, but is a um, very close to the penny budget that outlines some of the major objections and uh, objectives and directions that we think we're heading in as we move forward. The goal of tonight is to present the budget, to open the period of public comment, and to get a sense of the committee if these seem like a reasonable direction to head in so that we can move on to developing the budget books, which then provide a more detailed analysis of the budget um, and allow us to move the conversation forward. So I would like to begin with some appreciations. Um, just prior to the meeting tonight, there was some discussion about the, uh, the positive relationship between the schools and the city and the accomplishments that we have um, been able to come out of that. Um, it's one of the blessings that I think we all um, appreciate in Northampton and one of the um, blessings that is not necessarily shared by all of our neighbors or all the, com uh, all the communities across the Commonwealth. So since 2013, which is a year that we're taking as a benchmark because it ties to some of the analysis that comes up later in the presentation, we've been able to add about 20 teaching positions. <coughs> Almost all of those positions have been in special ed. I say about 20 because there are a lot of partial positions. Um, <coughs> and it, the head count may be more or less than 20, but in general it's been about 20 positions. And that's been in a time of more or less stable student population. It's not that we've added those positions in order to address a growing student population. Um, the numbers have been some years up and some years down, but overall we're about at the same place in terms of the number of students as we were in 2013. We've been able to add more teaching positions, so it reduces the ratio for each teacher. In the area of special education specifically, we've been able to uh, reduce this, the student to teacher ratio by more than 30%. In 2013, we had 14.7 
students with disabilities for every special education teacher. Currently, we have about 11 students for every special education teacher. We've been able to increase average teacher salaries by more than 7%. We've been able to increase per pupil expenditures by more than 14%. We've built a functional district-wide Wi-Fi system. Um, you remember the many meetings of struggle as we tried to build first from the high school to JFK to all the schools and then to get the thing actually working. That's actually happening now. <laughs> Um, and as we discussed at the last meeting, we've upgraded our math curriculum to Math Investigations 3, something that, as far as we can tell, has been a good choice, resulting in accelerated student learning. I'd also like to point out some accomplishments. We have five of six schools in the top half of Massachusetts schools in ELA achievement. And Massachusetts is the top state in the nation. Um, so to be in the top half of the top state, I think, indicates that we're providing a good quality of education for our residents, a good value for the tax dollars that are being spent on public education. Um, those of you who follow me on Twitter know that there was a, uh, another one of these rankings of the top 50 districts in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and Northampton is on that list. It's one of only six in Western Massachusetts. Um, I don't place a lot of stock in these systems that rank schools like athletic teams, but for what it's worth, um, the quality we provide is being recognized by people who do those sort of ranking things. We've been able to reduce the incidence of disability <coughs> identification this has been part of the goal of RTI. When we started, 23.1% of students in the district were identified as students with disabilities. Now, 19.5%. That was done for two reasons. One, strategically, we know that if we can keep students from developing learning disabilities early on, we can put them on a different trajectory for growth and achievement throughout their career. And we also know that if we can prevent the inappropriate identification of students with disabilities, that we can um, prevent the inappropriate use of resources um, in, in the special education program that could be better spent in the general education program. We've also increased rating reading SAT scores. Uh, I have presented this in terms of percentile ranking instead of absolute scores because there's been a change to SAT during this time frame. In all students, we've increased from the 90th percentile to the 91st percentile of reading achievement, and we did that while increasing the number of students tested by a third. That's important because SAT, like unlike other tests, is a self-selected group. If you increase the number of test takers, typically you would expect your test scores to go down. Here we've been able to substantially increase the number of test takers, and we've been able to increase performance. Not by a lot, but still in the top 10%. For students with disabilities, the reading SAT scores have increased from the 51st percentile to the 78th percentile since 2013. And that also was while increasing the number of students tested. So it was 18 students tested in 2013 and then 21 tested in the last year we have results for. <coughs> Moving on to challenges. Um, we still have a system that exacerbates learning gaps between high needs and non-high needs students. You know that I often come to you with pictures of achievement that look like graphs with lines. And if you look at the starting point for our high need students and the starting point for our, our non-high need students, they're different. And the gap between them widens as they, they progress through the school. So that is a challenge that we're continuing to, to see and a challenge that we need to continue to work on. This budget provides some ideas for addressing that challenge. We still have a system, I think it's appropriate to say, in this year where we've identified anti-bias training as one of our goals that disciplines black and Hispanic students at higher rates than their white peers. 
Um, you can see from 2013 to 2017, there's very little difference. And that's, that's, an, that's a concern. The, the metric that a lot of organizations use to trigger a disproportionality finding is 10%. So we've managed to stay below the 12.3 or the 12.1% that would be a, a signal of disproportionality, but you still have black and Hispanic students being disciplined at three to four times the rate of their white peers. We also have, um, as we've discussed many times at these meetings this year, seen a degradation of relational trust among some individuals. And we know that trust is really a building block of high performing schools. So that's a challenge that we're hoping to address through this budget as well. We have also, as part of the process this year, wanted to make the, the um, the opportunity for community participation and involvement even more significant than it's been in the past. We did that by launching a survey a few months prior to beginning the, the real serious work on the budget. I wanted to share with you some of the survey results so that as, you're, as we get to the point where I bring forward my proposals, you can check them against whether they match or do not match what the community has told us they're looking for in the budget. So all of these results are based on a survey size of 283 responses. I think that's a very robust sample size given the size of our district. And it's a, it's a almost even split between parents and employees. And that green pie piece is a parent and an employee. So at least 45% uh, of the respondents were a parent even if they were a parent who was also an employee, and about half of the respondents were um, employees. Actually, let me reverse that. It was 55% parents and 45% employees or parents who were also employees. Where they came from, we asked each of the respondents to identify the school that they felt they had the most direct experience with. It, you can see that it tends a little bit more towards elementary schools. Interesting because those are some of our smaller schools. But um, Bridge Street, Jackson Street, and JFK all had very high and similar rates from 70 to 74 respondents. Leeds and Ryan Road had fewer, 38 and, and 27 respectively. The high school came in kind of in between those, those sort of two ranges with 53. And then we did have 20 people who said they had experiences with multiple schools and didn't identify specifically with anyone. So these results may skew a little bit more to um, younger students or parents of younger students or employees who work in with younger students, but we do have responses from all, all levels of the pre-K to 12 system. One of the questions we asked was, how important do you think it is to allocate resources to expand the number of licensed staff, i.e. teachers, counselors, and administrators? This was a question that more than 85% of, of respondents said they either strongly agreed or somewhat agreed with. It was a um, question that I think evoked a strong affirmative response. And we asked, how important do you think it is to allocate resources to expand the number of non-licensed staff, such as IEPs, clerks, custodians, cafeteria workers? There was quite a difference there. Um, for this category, it was about 67% of respondents who said they strongly agreed or somewhat agreed with the, with the proposition. And you'll notice that there was a larger percentage who were within the somewhat agree category rather than the strongly agree category. So there definitely was a preference for more licensed staff as opposed to more non-licensed staff. Then we asked within those two categories, first, what do you believe to be the biggest staffing need in NPS amongst licensed staff? 
There, the dominant group was teachers, Mo most people responding that we need more teachers. And the second highest group was counselors. Uh, I will just point out, somewhat breaks my heart, that the, the smallest group was administrators. <laughs> The next question asked, within the non-licensed staff, which category of employee do you think represents the biggest staffing need? Here it was clearly ESPs, 72.4% indicating that if we can hire more non-licensed staff, they should be ESPs. There were also items that required the respondents to rank order different categories both within what were considered to be academic core areas and non-academic core areas. There were eight items to rank in each of these, so we looked at, in, in most of them, which categories were ranked first or second, because that would indicate um, a, a preference, and which category was ranked lowest, because that would represent choosing against. So in the um, area of core academic, core academics, 46 identified hiring more core academic teachers as a first or second priority, and 44% identified reducing class size as a first or second priority, and 55% identified increasing site-based budgets for materials and supplies as the lowest priority. And we also asked, in addition to the core academic program, what do you, where do you think we should place the highest priority? Here we went a little bit farther because there was really not a lot of separation between the second highest and the third highest. 59% identified student services as the first or second priority, which is a standout result. Actually, if you look at the graph, most of those identified it as the first priority. 44% identified visual and performing arts as a first or second priority, and 41 identified instructional technology as a first or second priority. 51% identified athletics as the lowest priority. And this is one that we disaggregated a little bit further because we had a hypothesis that athletics might be at a disadvantage in this rank ordering exercise because it's really only the high school that has an athletic program. So looking at just those who identified themselves as being most familiar with the high school, student services was still the first priority, but buildings and grounds was identified as the lowest priority. We then had some open-ended questions, which we, um, as an administrative leadership team, worked through every single response, tried to code them, and tried to come up with patterns. One of the questions asked, in your own words, where do you believe the NPS budget should be focused in regards to academic programs? And there were really only two responses. There were many variations on them. But we saw academic supports for struggling students and social emotional supports for struggling students as the, the two things that came out of the open-ended response. We also asked where the <coughs> budget should be focused in regards to non-academics. And again, we saw two main responses come forward from, from those qualitative responses. Well, maybe three. There was an arts group and a humanities group that we kind of combined into arts and humanities. And then there were responses about increasing technology was the other, other pattern there. Then we asked, this question, which was the only question that was piped in the survey, we asked respondents to indicate their level of agreement with the following statement, NPS allocates its funds to school sites equitably. And as we understand this, this is a pie chart that shows you people completely all over the place. A third are leaning towards agreement with that statement, a third are leaning towards disagreement with that statement, and about a third are completely neutral on that statement. So um, for us, that suggests the, the need to do a better job of educating about the budget. 
This, as I said, this question was piped. So if you answered either somewhat disagree or strongly disagree on this, you were taken to another open-ended response that's, that asked, why do you feel the allocation of funds to school sites is inequitable? And we chose some, or I chose some sample responses to, to include in here, um, just to show kind of that there's no agreement on why it's inequitable. So one respondent wrote, it often feels like RFK is not getting an equitable split. Another person said there's not enough funding for Bridge Street School given the populations it serves. Another person said Jackson Street School has a larger population and still receives only one Title I reading and math teacher. Someone else says it seems like Leeds is the biggest elementary schools and it bears the biggest burden with outside programs using our space and our staff. Yet it does not see an equitable sized portion of the budget to compensate for this. Someone said the high school falls short of most major funding criteria relative to the state averages and other comparably sized schools. So just to make the point, every school except uh, JFK had advocates saying they were the ones that were being left out of the budget process. So that brings us to the goals for the budget. As I indicated going through the responses on the question, do we allocate our funds equitably? Our first goal is to enhance public education about the school budget and that's something that we'll be doing as part of this presentation tonight. Second is to continue to build capacity to meet student needs. Third is to maintain small class sizes. Fourth is to make a significant investment in educational technology. Fifth is to make some strategic shifts in professional development and language programs. And finally, to increase funding for the arts. It is the most modest of our goals, which is why it's um, listed at the bottom. We were a little bit disappointed on what we were able to come up with in that area. Um, but still, it, it is a start and it's an attempt to be responsive to information we got from the survey. So, in order to enhance education about the budget process, we want to share some information looking at equity and adequacy both within the district, i.e. comparing district, uh, district schools to each other, and then across districts. Um, couple of things to point out and within the district comparisons. I really think that personnel is the key metric. It's 75% of the budget and the ratios are so much more important than the total payroll <coughs> because there's a 94% 94 diff difference from the top to the bottom of the teacher pay scale. And we don't say that a teacher at the top of the scale needs to take 94% more students than a teacher at the bottom of the scale. So if you're looking just at uh, payroll, which is most of the budget, um, that can create some distortions in um, your understanding of what resources are actually being provided. If you have a school that is disproportionately staffed by teachers who are at the bottom of the scale or a school that's disproportionately staffed by teachers at the top of the scale. So I think um, the best way to look at that is just teachers. We also have the opportunity due to uh, some new, inf new tools that the Department of Education has provided to us based on the information that we provide to them in our end of year report to compare our spending and allocation in different areas to comparable districts. This is known as the resource allocation and district action reports and that little radar icon that you see at the bottom of the page will be displayed anytime I'm showing information that's taken directly from the radar tool. So first to talk about current staffing ratios within NPS. I apologize that this is um, difficult to read, but the budget is now on the district website. And um, people will have, have, will have a month to wade into these figures. I do want to point out um, one convention of, of uh, naming staff that may be a little bit unfamiliar to the public, but is quite familiar to administrators. It's the notion of FTEs per 100 students. An FTE is a full-time equivalent. Um, so an FTE per 100 students means the number of full-time staff per 
hundred students enrolled in the school. It's a way of trying to um, make schools with different, different uh, enrollments comparable to each other. Um, we did put the student to staff ratio in most of these um, because I think that's a, a metric that most people are, are more familiar with. But in some of them, we, we defaulted to the FTE per 100 student uh, ratio. And we did that in areas where we had small numbers of staff. For example, if you look at instructional coaches, there's one instructional coach at this time that's split among the four elementary schools. So each of them has a 0.25 FTE of that coach. Um, but if you did a traditional student to teacher ratio, you'd get a very strange result, right? You'd have like a thousand students to one teacher at Bridge Street School, which only has 284 students. So that's why we use the um, FTE per 100 student ratio, which you see in those boxes that are split. We also do the same thing with ESL teachers because, again, those are um, relatively low uh, numbers of educators at each of the buildings. And so in, in that row, we have split first the um, student ratio or the number of students and the FTEs present in the building, and then that number converted to an FTE per 100 student ratio. Um, the other area where we've been working on providing greater equity is the expense accounts. This was the thing from the survey that people said should be the lowest priority for schools, but it's, I think, an important area. It's an area where the principal and the school councils really have their most flexibility for school-based decision making because the money tied up in personnel is really beyond the reach. Um, so the, the money that's really under the control of the principal in consultation with their councils is these expense accounts. So there have been aberrations in this that we've been working to to address. In FY15, this is the one time when we don't go back to FY13 because we don't have budgets that allow us to figure it out going back that far. Um, but in FY15, there was a $111 differential in terms of per pupil allocation in expense accounts from the high school to the low school, the high school being JFK at the time and the low school being Leeds. By FY19, we had gotten that down to $66. The um, methodology we've been using for this is to set aside a certain amount of funding each year for adjustments to the per pupil, uh, per pupil funding. And we've been following sort of a hold harmless mentality of not creating equity by removing funds from schools, but by adding more funds to the schools that are farther behind in order to catch them up. Now you'll see that there are three schools there with asterisks. They um, would have higher expense account <coughs> per pupil funding, but in each of those three schools, the administration made the decision to convert some of their expense account funds into personnel, which then throws off our, um, our ability to sort of adjust to equity. So now they become schools with asterisks after them. I'm not really sure what to do to sort of represent that accurately. I guess what I'm saying is if, if you see an asterisk there, there was more money at a time provided in the expense account, but that got shifted over into payroll accounts when the school made the decision to use some of that money to buy more positions. So um, I didn't spend a lot of time on, on the staffing ratios, mainly because you can't see them here. But I do encourage staff to, or I do encourage staff, parents, and anyone who's interested in commenting on the budget to really spend a lot of time on slide 19 and take a look at the staffing ratios at the different buildings. I, because I, I do think they tell a story of near equity in the elementary schools. Um, they do show us, tell a story of differences between elementary, middle, and high, and that's because there are differences in student maturity and differences in the setup of schools that make it difficult to compare uh, 
what's appropriate ratio in an elementary school to what's an appropriate ratio or middle or high school. You know, many of our seniors, for example, are six months away from sitting in a class with three or 400 students and not even a teacher, and people think that's an appropriate ratio. Um, so the, the ratios that for older students do tend to be higher than ratios for younger students. And for 60 grand. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So moving on to the radar tool. Radar allows you to start your data inquiry by uh, selecting comparable districts and it gives you two sets of them. You identify the district that you're interested in and it gives you two sets of 10 similar districts. The first set of, of districts is, are districts that are similar on the basis of student demographics. So in the radar tool entering Northampton, you can see the 10 districts that are considered to be most similar to Northampton on the basis of demographics. And then you choose from there which districts you feel are most appropriate to carry forward for further analysis. So in this case, we carried Ludlow and South Hadley forward because they're the only two other Pioneer Valley districts that are identified as comparable to Northampton on the basis of demographics. The reason we did not choose communities that were outside of the Pioneer Valley is because there are a number of regional economic differences that end up swamping a lot of the economic comparisons and, and really reduce them to um, either misleading or, or difficult or inappropriate to interpret information. So we picked two from this list. You also get a second list of 10 that are districts with similar income. And this is the list of districts that's most similar to Northampton on the basis of income. And here, the one Pioneer Valley district that we carried forward for further analysis is Long Meadow. So you see that on the next slide, which is where you get to pick. You see Northampton, Ludlow, South Hadley, and Long Meadow um, loaded into the, into the tool, and there'll be further charts that we share um, about this in a little bit. Uh, I think the most striking thing about this, this, demogra or this table is that it shows the difference between the demographics of the community and the demographics of the students in the schools. Um, economically, we're most similar to Long Meadow, but demographically, we're similar to Ludlow or South Hadley. So you see a situation where community wealth and student need really are not lining up with each other. This uh, <clears throat> table just shows you how are you spending your resources in each of these categories that are identified on the end of the year report. There's administration, instructional leaders, teachers, other teaching services, professional development, instructional materials, guidance and psychology, pupil services, operation and maintenance, and benefits and fixed costs. One thing I would point out about this is pupil services for the purpose of the end of the year report has a different meaning than it has in the typical parlance of school administration. Here, pupil services are things like transportation, main transportation. Curricular athletics. Nurse, yes. Uh, nursing. Um, I think this shows that basically most of our, or all of our comparable districts are putting their money in the same places. You know, teachers are the biggest piece of the pie. Benefits and fixed costs are the next biggest piece of the pie, and everything else gets little slices. Then you can, um, derive a series of charts that shows staffing, <coughs> and here they use the staff per 100 student metric that I was talking about earlier, because it, it's a way of equalizing districts of different sizes, um, and they look at them by different categories. So this first chart shows our 
FTEs in administration per 100 students as compared to our comparable districts and as compared to the state. So you can see in two out of three of our comparable districts are, we're low, compared, comparatively speaking, on administration, and we're low compared to the state in administration. So, you know, I said it somewhat um, facetiously earlier that it, it bothered me that administration was seen as the lowest need in our district, at least on the survey, um, because I do think it is an area where we're light. I think it's an area where we're light, especially in the elementary level, um, where there's one administrator and it's a big job. So, you know, if you're at, if you're at JFK or Leeds, you're carrying a caseload of over 300 students. Um, and usually seeing them at the time when they're in some of their greatest needs. This is the comparison for teachers. Again, I, I should point out that all this is 2017 data, so this doesn't reflect our current um, data or the other district's current data. That won't be entered until we report what, we're, what we've done at, at our end of the year reporting period next fall. Um, so again, you know, very similar to comparable districts, slightly higher than the state. Here are paraprofessionals. Um, here we are, again, higher than two of our comparable districts. It's us in South Hadley that's kind of in a race for the most paraprofessionals. Um, and we're staffing the paraprofessionals, I think, quite a bit higher than the state. Here's clerical staff. This is um, the one area that we win on. I think this is a consequence, or my hypothesis is this is a consequence of having less administrative staff um, because in many cases, as you know, um, a lot of what clerical staff do is basic operations of the building, um, things that oftentimes um, verge on administrative tasks. So then this is a chart that is derived from the radar, but is not, does not come directly <coughs> from radar, so it doesn't have the, the um, logo on it. The reason that we developed this chart is because in the radar, they designate paraprofessionals as either general education or special education, and that's a very um, arbitrary distinction. Um, you'll see some districts that have 100% of their paraprofessionals designated as special ed paras. You'll have some districts that have most of their paraprofessionals designated as regular ed. There's no rule about how they need to be um, classified. It really is, you know, the judgment of their use. And in Northampton, we have most of our paraprofessionals identified as general ed paraprofessionals because they're not prevented from working with students who don't have IEPs. They can work with all students regardless of IEP status. We, we generally reserve the designation of special ed paraprofessional for those who are assigned to students on a one-to-one -one basis. So given that every district is reporting this differently, we felt the most fair way to represent this was just to say all paraprofessionals on a per 100 student basis. So the blue, and you can again see it's sort of Northampton and South Hadley in this race for paraprofessionals. There's, there's a uh, data issue, I think, in South Hadley in 2016. I really don't believe they had zero paraprofessionals. We have attempted to um, clarify that, but we haven't been able to get very far. So I would just take that one with a grain of salt. Um, I think maybe imputing a line that goes from the 2015 to the 2017 is probably more likely where it was. But the takeaway here is um, it's Northampton and South Hadley having more paraprofessionals, Ludlow and Longmeadow having fewer paraprofessionals. <clears throat> this is special education teachers per 100 students with disabilities. Again, um, I'm not sure 
I completely believe the South Hadley data for 2016 mm -hmm. and even for 2017. Um, but I think the statewide average is, is relevant and reliable. It's been about 5.4, 5.3 or 5.4 teachers per 100 students with disabilities on statewide um, level. In Northampton, we've never been that low. We've sort of steadily increased from 6.8 to, to 8.9. That doesn't include the five and a half teachers we added last year because that would be in the 2018 figure. So I would guess that number is probably somewhere around 10 per 100 students with disabilities now. So closing the gap with Ludlow, but in this comparison group, Ludlow far and away is the district that's providing the most special education teachers. This chart just sort of puts them all in a, a bar graph. Again, this is one that I kind of have a little bit of, um, I take with a little bit of grain of salt because it only counts paraprofessionals who are designated as special education paraprofessionals, and we know districts do that differently. But at least it allows you to compare the teachers, it allows you to compare the service providers and the support staff. Again, I think we fare pretty favorably compared to our similar districts with the exception of Ludlow, which is the, the district we're chasing in terms of staffing at this point, and do, do look better than the statewide average. So, you know, the takeaways that I, I, I take from all this is that um, there have been aberrations in the past in, and even to this day in terms of the purchase services and expenses component of the budget. We've been able to whittle that down and in this proposed budget we'll whittle it down more. Um, we have always strongly staffed in ESPs. Um, I think we've strongly staffed in teachers too. The, the district, if you want to think of us having a staffing gap with, would be Ludlow. Uh, and it, it's kind of an interesting story because in order to close the gap with Ludlow, we'd need about $2.4 million. Um, you just go back to the first chart. But we're doing better than them in two of the three tested areas. So. I'd rather have a positive achievement gap, even if with a negative spending gap, than be spending more and achieving less. Um, the flip side of that is South Hadley, where they would need another $1.1 million in order to catch up to Northampton, and they're doing better than we are in, in two of the three um, tested subjects. So um, take that for what it's worth. So that's, that's what I wanted to share in terms of education about where we stand, it, both in terms of our allocation of resources within the district and our allocation of resources as compared to other districts. Now I want to move on to the next goal of the budget, which is building the capacity to meet student needs and some of the proposals we're making for that. When you look at the chart, when you have time, I think the thing that may jump out to you is the area where we were. I think strongly and demonstrably be able to show that we're understaffed as in ESL teachers. And we've been, I've been telling the ESL staff for a number of years, this was gonna be the year where we really caught them up. We have been steadily adding uh, pieces of, of positions as we can. <clears throat> this is sort of the biggest um, investment that we're proposing to make in this year's budget. And it ad directly addresses the issue of increasing our capacity to meet student needs. So we'd like to add 1.33 ESL teachers. That would be a 0.4 addition for Bridge Street, 0.2 for Leeds, 0.2 for Ryan Road, 0.2 for JFK, and 0.33 for the high school. These are all um, situations where we're increasing the, the um, increasing the assignments for staff who are currently part-time. So we would hope to be able to achieve all these increases without changing headcount. It would make the positions, I think, more effective, more attractive for our current employees and um, would have the benefit of us being able to use staff that we are already familiar with. Additionally, we'd like to add two ESL ESPs. 
These would be specially trained bilingual ESPs, one for Bridge Street School and one for JFK. The rationale for that is that even with the increases in our um, allocation of ESL teachers, there would still be students who may need assistance and an ESL teacher might not be readily available <coughs> at Bridge Street and JFK to assist. So the addition of the ESPs are meant to buttress the supports that we would look to, look to provide with the ESL teachers. We also want to increase interpretation services. This is more or less a guess based on how much we're under budgeted in those accounts this year. Um, we were a little bit caught by surprise um, because of the number of students who we've helped to resettle or at least assist while they're, they're dislocated by Hurricane Maria. That had a lot to do with our um, under budgeting and interpretation services. We have no real way of projecting what the continuing need to assist those students will be next year. We don't, but again, um, we know just in a nod to science, we're living in an age of global warming and there'll be other hurricanes and we may be faced, oh my gosh, what's that? <laughs> we may be faced with a similar situation again next year. <laughs> Thank you for adding some <laughs> Uh, continuing, continuing down the list of proposals to build capacity to meet student needs, we'd like to add a board certified behavior analyst at Bridge Street School. This is a request that comes directly out of the many discussions that have been taking place at Bridge Street School. We have uh, about 25 hours of support in the area of um, behavior analysis at Bridge Street School this year but it's being provided on a contract basis. Um, there have been some concerns raised by that, about that by staff. First, that it's not full time, um, so this would address that. And second, that it's different people sharing the um, consultation responsibility. So this, um, this change we think is, is very responsive to that, that request. Next is special education teachers. We'd like to add 2.17 FTEs of those. That's a half-time special ed teacher for Bridge Street School and 1.67 for the high school. You get those funny fractions for the high school because of the block scheduling. Um, I think 0.67 means that you teach a full schedule for half of the year and a part schedule for the other half of the year. We'd also like to add an ASL interpreter to the high school. We have um, <coughs> some hearing impaired students whose primary form of communication is ASL. We have some non-hearing Im impaired students who are very interested in learning ASL and um, hopefully provide good peer group for our students who are hearing impaired. Right now we don't have ASL interpretation services, but we do anticipate that we will have students with more significant hearing needs next year, and so we'd like to add that position there. Uh, we, I would also say that um, we are seeing some migration of students from out of district placements back into the district, and so uh, many of these positions, including the ones that I've discussed at the high school, are essentially, as I'll explain later on, um, made possible by converting tuition accounts into personnel accounts. Next, we'd like to increase the number of special education ESPs, six. Um, so that would be one for Bridge Street, one for Jackson, two for Leeds, one for Ryan Road, and one for the high school. This story is related to um, the prior story. Many of the times, students who are coming back to our schools from out of district placement, are, as you would imagine, are coming with higher needs. Some of these um, paraprofessionals are needed in order to accommodate students coming from out of district placement, and some of the financing for them is based on t basically converting t tuition accounts into payroll accounts. Next, we'd like to hire a, an additional certified 
occupational therapy assistant. This would be a district-wide position. And we'd like to create a unified basketball team. For those of you who don't know or may not be familiar with that term, a unified basketball team is an inclusive sports event where students with disabilities and non-disabled peers work on the same team in competition with other unified teams. This would be a co-ed team, so it would be inclusive not only of students with disabilities and non-disabled peers, but also of boys and girls. This is sort of the cutting edge of Special Olympics. It's about taking it from an event that happens a couple of times a year and making it a bona fide part of a child's high school experience. Joe, your number is 49. 49. All right. <laughs> okay, so moving on to our next goal, to maintain small class sizes, we're recommending adding two additional classes at the elementary level, a third kindergarten at Leeds and a third first grade at Bridge. Um, these are based on our current projected enrollments for kindergarten. We do think we need to go to 11 classes there. Um, we're up at this point over 200, I think, um, and that number tends to grow. Our projection is with um, these changes, we probably will be able to reduce the average class size at the elementary level from 19 to 18. Next, to invest in educational technology, we'd like to initiate a one-to-one -one program at JFK double the number of Chromebooks at the high school, increase the high school tech integrator to 0.5. That's because we actually have a long range plan to introduce a one-to-one -one program at the high school starting next year. And in order to prepare for that, we really feel that it's important to increase the tech integrator um, time up there. This is a position that is just in the budget for the first time this year and was just added at a half time rate uh, at the elementary and middle schools, they've had tech integrators for a much longer time and I think are farther down the road in terms of preparedness to use technology to change the way they deliver instruction because of that. We also want to increase our IT systems specialist. This is a part-time position within the IT department who provides technical support to machines. If we're incre and, and systems. If we're increasing the number of machines in the district, we predict that we will have more service calls and so we want to be prepared for that by increasing that position. We also want to expand our mobile hotspot loaning program. It may be better um, termed or described our, our uh, computer loaning program because we did put mobile hotspots and Chromebooks in the libraries at the middle and high school in order to address digital divide issues so that students, especially since in this day and age, even though we strongly encourage teachers to try to not offer um, assignments that require the use of technology, it's, it's nearly unavoidable, um, especially since we are now buying um, are now buying curriculum materials that are in part online. Um, but what we found through the mobile hotspot loaning program is that students are taking computers much more than they're taking the hotspots. Um, so we are going to do a little bit more analysis on this, but it may well be the case that we have enough hotspots or we only have to modestly increase the number of hotspots, but we probably will be expanding the number of devices we have for students to take home. because. It, it seems, it appears that students have Wi-Fi access either they're in their home or some other place, but they may not have a de device to use um, for their learning. We uh, also have just been notified that we received a Digital Connections Partnership Grant. This will be used to allow us to further improve our Wi-Fi system throughout the district. Um, as I mentioned, it has come so far since 2014, but there, there are always ways to make it better. There are always new demands on bandwidth. Um, this, this program will allow us to leverage some E-rate money to really make some significant investments in improving our Wi-Fi service within the district. 
We've also been um, notified that we've received a grant from Project Lead the Way, which is a, uh, a curriculum used to help teach computational thinking. The grant is for middle school students and will begin to be implemented next year. And I think it addresses some of the issues that may come up in um, discussions or considerations of one-to-one, -one, um, which is the, the key really isn't the device. The key is what you're doing with the device. And what we're really trying to do is teach computational thinking because we think that that, as best we can tell, is the place where the opportunities for students in the economy they'll enter will be. Um, and one thing that I just, I'll share with you is one of my learnings um, from Project Lead the Way around this um, issue or, or concern about um, potential misuses of devices or even the concern that having any device at all is, is potentially harmful to kids, is that the first computer program, as best we could tell, was written 100 years before the first computer was invented. So you can do computational thinking without a computer. Um, and it's really, it's really um, <coughs> that type of knowledge, that way of looking at the world, that way of being able to interact with the ubiquitous technology that will be in the foreseeable future of our, our students' lives that we want to support through Project Lead the Way. It also will become a, a nice preparation. See, if I had some better technology <laughs> skills right now, I could stop that thing from happening. <laughs> Remind me in two days. <laughs> I'll be done in an hour. That's, that's safe. <laughs> um, we also, as you know, are, have received the first stage of an Information Technology Innovation Pathway Grant. That was a $10,000 planning grant. Um, we described the, the Innovation Pathway in the program of studies that was approved at the last school committee meeting. And Project Lead the Way will be sort of the on-ramp for kids getting into the Technology Innovation Pathway Grant. There is a second stage. I think I'll, um, I, I've, notif I've, I've notified the committee, but just to say to the public, we've also been invited to um, participate in the Stage 2 grant for Innovation Pathway, so we may be able to benefit from additional funding to help build up that program for students in the high school. Next, we want to make some strategic shifts. Um, first, we want to move to instructional coaching, PLCs, and an online <coughs> platform as the primary forms of professional development. I have some slides in a few minutes that will help explain why that is, is the direction we're heading in. And then um, probably the most controversial of, of the proposals so far is to begin the process of trying to stand up a Chinese language program. Um, and also to um, add ASL at the high school. Um, so just to talk about Chinese for a little bit, um, you know, this is, this is one where we just have an opportunity to take advantage of a, a condition that may not always exist. Um, we, and this is information that I've shared with um, my superintendents who are also going to be sharing it with their communities tonight. In Amherst and Hadley, there is a strong desire to provide Chinese language programs as well. Amherst has a <coughs> full-time Chinese teacher and is looking to expand to a 1.2 next year and is really concerned about where will we be able to hire someone for 0.2. Hadley, um, for its own reasons, wants to get involved with the Chinese language program we certainly can't use a full-time Chinese teacher. You know, if we begin standing up a program, we would be talking about seventh graders only next year, and we're only talking about a small portion of those who may have an interest in Chinese. Um, but I think for what's small money in the overall scope of the budget, we have an opportunity to collaborate with those two other districts to put together a position that might be s successful in attracting a person. and. It will give us an opportunity to see whether or not there is a desire 
for a Chinese language program in Northampton. Um, I think this, you know, I'll just also say this. This is not about any of those other districts. This is just about um, us. So much of the discussion in this room and, and advocacy and other venues has been around trying to address the issue of charter schools and the drain on our um, city budget. You know, for the, the money that we're proposing to invest in a Chinese language program, if we were to um, return or prevent two students from attending Chinese immersion, it would pay for itself. Um, the experience in Amherst has been that students have returned. I don't know if that will be the experience here. I don't even know if it'll be the experience that kids will sign up. But we have a chance to do something here, and I would advocate spending a small portion of our budget on attempting this innovation to see whether or not it makes sense for us. So um, moving to the shifts in professional development, this also difficult to see chart it shows our attendance at all of the professional development that we've provided this year in, in co-teaching and inclusion. Um, and you, you can see the format, you can see <coughs> location, the number of seats that we had available, and the number of seats that were filled with our teachers by school. Um, so I think that the thing that jumps out about this is that the two events that we were really able to provide strong participation in were the District PD Day, Lisa Deeker workshop, and the District PD Day, Thomas Hare workshop. What's unique about those are those were the days that we could mandate attendance at. The other days, these were the, the specific trainings and the specific trainers that were requested by staff, but attendance was really low because we could not mandate attendance. This next slide shows professional development and participation in other topics. Um, again, you'll see one thing that stands out here, which is the anti-bias training by Barbara Love. Um, I, for the first, the 9-1 and then 10-4 and 11-7, those were workshops that we were able to assign people to, and you can see they were well attended. The other workshops, even though, remember, in the district improvement plan, we identified <coughs> anti-bias training this year at the you know, request of the staff. Um, attendance is still low. The other thing that, um, that jumps out is there is sort of one little countervailing trend here, which are the last two workshops, Spanish and math recovery. Uh, what I think is different about those are those are the workshops that are provided by NPS staff. So I have shared in, in other venues that our staff has a much uh, higher probability of attending workshops provided by its own members of its own faculty than attending anything provided by anyone from the outside. So putting those two pieces of information together, um, that leads us to recommend increasing coaching as one of our um, strategies for professional development. Um, because with coaching, it's essentially mandatory training, and it's actually inescapable training because the training comes into your classroom. So um, we, uh, we've, have been, um, I think, positive about the, the beginning of ELA coaching this year. There certainly have been um, some bumps in the road and some things that have needed to be worked out, but we'd like to continue that next year with um, adding a math coach. Now, I gotta tell you, there was a discussion about, well, should it be a math coach or should it be an inclusion coach? Um, where we ended up coming down on that was we wanted to have a math coach, a math coach who was well-versed in inclusion, who could help um, teachers deal with a wide variety of needs within their class with the content sort of in the, at the center 
and bringing in disability and, and, and all levels of ability sort of around the content. The other thing that we're looking to do is um, purchase an online professional development um, format for, for our staff. We have provided, we started the process this year by providing some mandatory training on an online. This was part of the budget discussions, um, not the budget discussions, the contract discussions where teachers said, you know, we don't want you to tell us when we have to do professional development. We just have, to, we want you to tell us what we need and give us a deadline, um, which is something that we can provide with an online format and then teachers can have freedom to decide when they want to receive professional development. So we'll be looking to, that is in the budget, and we'll be looking to institute that next year as well. And so then this is the one that I guess I said that we wish we could have gone a little bit farther with, but um, we are still happy to be able to at least advocate for this, which is increased funding for the arts. Um, we have a part-time band position and a part-time choral position. Our proposal would be this year to make the band position full-time. We need to um, hire that position this year because the, the person is going, um, is retiring. So we think that'll increase our chances of getting a high quality person. We also um, uh, put this out there as a potential, though not guaranteed, um, option for music. <coughs> um, we've had some discussions about musical and the role that the perception that the negotiated stipends are not adequate um, had in blocking the musical from happening this year. We could, um, with a full-time teacher, keep the current course load and add musical as, a, as the additional block in a full-time schedule, which would take the money issue off the table. However, I want to say I'm not guaranteeing that that's how this person would be used. As um, Mr. Lombardi pointed out to me when we were discussing this position, <coughs> if, you know, well, first of all, I really have no expertise at all in any of this stuff, and neither does he. I, I don't think he minds me saying that. Um, if, if the music teachers make a principled argument that MT, METG is really the thing that students should be doing now and that musical is not the best experience, um, then this block would be used for some other um, music class, which we certainly could um, we could offer to students. Um, you know, in that scenario, what we'd want to do is provide a, a music class that may be more accessible to students who right now are not able to access the music because they sort of require a certain level of skill that some of our students just don't have. So that's the proposal there. So the last part and question you'll all have is how do you make all that stuff work? So first we take a look at what I'm going to call a status quo budget is. It's not really a level service budget because it's just um, a budget that tries to keep the current programs running more or less the way they are now without being an exact duplicate. So it's kind of a level service budget. Um, you can see the, the um, base pay changes, as always, are the biggest part of that. Special ed increases, as frequently, are the next biggest part of that. And then the, the rest of the different um, accounts that we will have to absorb pretty much in any scenario of uh, a budget for next year. The one thing that I want to point out that kind of is unique here is we're actually uh, asking to budget less for utilities. One thing that um, people have heard me say in addressing our current budget deficits is we're hoping that solar comes through for us and allows us to um, experience some savings that, that we can put towards some of the deficits in the current budget. It, we feel more comfortable now that that solar savings will be realized. And so the major reason that we're um, proposing a reduction in utilities in a status quo um, budget next year is because um, we're starting to believe that the solar savings will actually appear. So the total of all the status quo changes <coughs> is $787,400. We are 
anticipating really the only additional revenue being the, the local appropriation. Um, as you've all experienced, you now have a, a big pay raise from the federal government. So the, the downside to that is we don't expect to see any increases in grants. In fact, we're projecting decreases in grants from the federal government. Um, there is an anticipated circuit breaker reduction, as I've discussed before, um, because of uh, the audit finding in the extraordinary relief claim for last year, which will impact the circuit breaker funding available for next year. So that money will be down. But we've already reflected the circuit breaker reduction in the status quo scenario on the prior page. So if you take the appropriation increase um, and you subtract what's needed for a status quo budget, it leaves you about $77,796 to try to do something with. Doesn't obviously won't, not enough to pay for everything we're recommending. So as has been the case in every year since um, I've been here, a lot of the budget um, new growth is financed by restructuring old things in the budget. So here are um, places where we think we can make some adjustments. Uh, I've talked in other um, talked in some other cases about returning students from out of district placements. What this slide shows is where we're using returning students from out of district tuition savings in order to hire new staff. And so you can see returning students from out of district paying for the interpreter, the sped teacher, and the ESP at the high school, they net out to zero. You see eliminating BCA, BCBA contract at Bridge Street School and then using that money to hire a BCBA for Bridge Street School, so that nets out to zero. Um, reducing therapy contract services in order to pay for a quota, and reducing home tutor testing. So that, all of that really just gets you 16,000, um, but it allows us to pay for the positions that were listed within that slide um, without touching the $77,000 from the previous slide. Then we go to reductions. These are actual reductions. So uh, we'd like to reduce $5,000 from maintenance expense accounts, $1,100 from custodial sick leave incentive. Those are just um, based on budgeting and, and how it has played out in the past where we think we can make some, some, some shaving, uh, more than savings. Um, we, the unit A hourly rate transfers, when you had done an earlier version of the budget, we said what, uh, if we want to maintain the same number of teacher hours beyond the end of their contract time as we have in this year, we're going to need to add $33,750 because the hourly rate is going up from 25 to 30. So one of the things we said was, well, we don't necessarily have to do that. We can just level fund that and it would mean that we approve fewer out-of-day uh, work opportunities for teachers. So that's a cut, but it's really a level fund. It's a, it's a cut based on our original projection of maintaining the same number of hours. Next, um, District PD. Um, this is in addition to um, something I'm going to show you later about how we think we can fund the coach. This really reflects more than anything else the fact that we're coming off of the more intensive training in Math Investigations 3. Um, this was the year we implemented. This was the year we needed to increase. And so we feel that we can cut back there without having too much of a negative impact. We think we can reduce an ESP at JFK. It's just based on students leaving eighth grade and, and new entering students in um, sixth grade. We think we can reduce or eliminate the funds for Raptor. Um, Raptor never really worked out the way we wanted it to. There were problems at Ryan Road. We did investigate some other systems. Um, this, you know, in this week especially, it, it's a hard thing to talk about. And we won't get into specific tactics, but I will say that um, we have had a lot of discussions around access control. And really, um, that's where we think <coughs> the game is rather than sign in control. Because um, once the envelope is breached, it's kind of already too late. Um, so next, uh, we have a home visit program that was 
supposed to be starting this year um, because of the inability to negotiate that. We don't think that'll happen next year, so we can eliminate that. Bilingual supplies, this is an unusual line in the um, district-wide budget. This is for bilingual supplies purchased at the district-wide level. Um, every school purchases bilingual supplies. Um, we do translations, which is our main, in central office, which is our main form of bilingual supply, if you will. Um, so this is really an account that isn't touched, so we think that can be eliminated. Again, multicultural supplies. We have a great number of multicultural supplies um, that are purchased in the building-based budgets, but there's this $100 district-wide line item that nobody ever really accesses, so we feel we can get rid of that. The, we, feel that we can eliminate a high school ESP. This is not a net elimination because we're adding a high school ESP on another slide, but um, just to try to have some position control and <coughs> some financial control, we want to list the cut. We, we can eliminate, um, and this next one is eliminating a position that we were never able to fill. Um, the current budget included a bilingual ESP who was really um, intended to be an assistant to our outreach social worker we really um, could not make that work. We just were never able to fill the position. So we would propose eliminating that. And then uh, academic support teacher. This is one of the um, positions that we've been transferring funds into in order to increase at the high school. But with the addition of special education staff in this budget, we no longer feel that we would need the academic support teacher next year. So. All those reductions come to $136,099. So adding that to the other items, you now have a little less than a quarter of a million dollars that you can use to finance some of those budget goals. Um, so, and then just costing out the other budget goals that uh, haven't been accounted for already. Here you can see what they come to. I guess I'll just point out that the 11th grade kindergarten class at Leeds only costs $19,000 because um, Leeds has that, those two small classes that are bubbling through. So we have a grade that we need to reduce anyways, um, one of the upper grades. And so we can just recycle that position to become another kindergarten teacher. And then you only need to have, add an ESP to make a, a kindergarten class. Um, Anyways, the total of all the increases not accounted for so far is $428,431. I do want to just go back very briefly to some of the ones we've already accounted for and some of the other ones that we're paying for through other means. We have increases funded by trade-offs. <coughs> the VSS BCBA, as I said, is funded by eliminating the contract BCBA. The district-wide coda is funded by eliminating the contract coda. The math coach is funded by eliminating all of those, or not all, but nearly all of those external expert professional developments that nobody goes to anyway. The high school special ed teacher, ASL interpreter, and ESP are paid for by converting tuition funds into personnel accounts. And then we have some that are funded from other resources. Uh, we'd like to increase the digital learners, literacy and computer science coordinator to a 12-month position. But as I said, we've achieved a number of grants, or received a number of grants in technology, and we're in the running for some others. We'd like to fund that from those. Um, we'd like to add the possibility of six ath assistant athletic coaches. We don't um, necessarily know if, if we will actually need them, but at least to like, plan for them. Those will be paid for by athletic revolving accounts. And athletic site managers, one per season, would also be funded for by athletic revolving accounts. So putting it all together kind of in a two-column summary, you can see the increases and the decreases. And then it all rolls up into this math problem, which is the amount available with restructuring, 229868 the cost of recommended additions that aren't paid for in some other way is 428,431. The amount we need to go into our reserve this year 
would be $161,029. That's consistent with the stability plan. You'll notice that that doesn't work out as a difference between those two numbers. That's because this isn't a to the penny budget. There are lots of other little miscellaneous costs that haven't been reflected anywhere in this presentation. Um, but that's where we would um, be going. We had originally um, thought that we'd be going almost $400,000 into the stability, into the reserve this year. So we can do that without hitting um, that level. So I think it's a comfortable level for me. Uh, I did also just want to add this summary page. This wasn't in the materials that went out last Friday, but I added it this morning because I think it just may be an easy way for people to kind of get caught up to all the things that have been moving in this budget. This is cost center allocation changes. So it just shows, remember, I said money is not the important thing. Staff is the important thing. But to look at it in terms of dollars, Bridge Street would increase 203,000, Leeds 58,000, Jackson Street 93,000, Ryan Road 32,000, JFK Middle School 35,000, the high school 273,000. A lot of that is because those out of district tuitions are currently in special ed and will be turned into. Um, personnel accounts in the high school cost center. Athletics, 16,000. Central Services is the only cost center that's getting a reduction because of solar savings. District-wide accounts, 130,000. And student services, 91,000. How does, the last question is, how does this impact our stability plan? This is a chart you've seen every year. This is what it looks like this year. Um, so you can see last year was the peak. This year, um, we're digging into reserves a little bit farther. Next year, even more in 2021. We did uh, push out just a little bit. Um, you can see that there's a small amount left in 2021 after we spend the reserve. Um, so it now looks like we run out of money very early on in 2022. It doesn't really matter. We'll have to be making the cuts in 2021 to the 2022 budget if um, nothing changes. But we are still on track, but on track means headed for a day when we can't pay our bills. So that's my budget presentation. Thank you, Dr. Provost. So um, before we move into any public comment, do we have uh, questions, comments uh, from the school committee? Any questions or comments? Yes, so Mr. Coffin. This, this would be my first uh, go around of the budget. How, how does this work? Like, I have 30 questions. <laughs> email those to the superintendent. Is this the time to discuss this? Um, what is the, give me some help if you don't mind. Like, what's the process for I mean, I think if you, if you have some effective way for us to do this. I think if you have some key questions tonight and then want to email the other 28, that would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think it's fair to ask some questions. But if you have a, a, a that long a list of questions, certainly it would probably be more expeditious tonight to have uh, Dr. Provost um, answer those and then he could even share them with everyone else so that we'd all have the knowledge that, that you got from those as well. I was so. exaggerating. I was just joking. Okay. Thing. Well. Um, and again, this is the first pass, so you right. will. We're trying to give feedback tonight on is he headed in the right direction, so that when he and Ms. Walzak go to put together the budget book, mm -hmm. they'll have more concrete numbers. They're not wasting their time or, or going so far off track that the school committee is going to get the book and say this is not what we want. So. So the questions might be prioritized towards those things that are major, major uh, decisions or large fluctuations as mm -hmm. opposed to what does this mean, what does that mean, I can handle that in the, mm -hmm. in the separate Sure, yeah. sure, yeah. Go fire okay. away. So one, one of my questions I guess I'm confused with is the difference between like the stability budget. Um, if you can just let me understand, you said that we're using 166,000 from that. So what's the difference between that stability budget and the five? I can't read it. The 2018, I think it's 588. Could you help me understand that? So I think the key thing here is to look at the 
amount above zero and the amount below zero. In 2015 to 2017, we were receiving school choice funds in excess of what we were spending out of the school choice account. So we were building up that balance. Yep. Starting in 2018, we were spending more school choice funds than we were receiving. We're going farther into that in next year's budget. And um, so one of the things that I should, uh, I guess, just point out about this is our budgeting strategy has always been to spend the money received in one year in the, pro in the next year. Okay, so we're now at the point where we can't spend the money, well, we can spend the money that we receive this year, next year, but it's not enough. So now we're going into that reserve we've built up. And when we get to 2022, we're actually spending the money we receive in the year we receive it and spending the money from the reserve, and there's still not enough. Just, just to provide greater transparency, it operates um, kind of in a, uh, I don't want to use the term lockbox, but it's the only one that comes to me right now, um, because we don't want to transfer funds from the operating budget or per positions from the high school in order to subsidize athletics or vice versa. So they sort of have to make their budget work and the high school needs to make their budget work. Yes. School. So how does JFK and the high school receive their professional development then? Well, as they don't receive coaching, right? So that it's less. I'll, right. I'll be, I'm going to admit that from the beginning. Okay. Um, we do hope we can do, we will still be doing some district uh, mandated right. yeah. professional yeah. development. Yeah. We will be providing the online format and we, I didn't talk about it a lot, but we are also doing PLCs, and we have seen PLCs as um, an option that teachers have shown, um, which is professional learning communities, which is something that teachers have shown a willingness to participate in. And I think it has been even a little bit um, more heavily subscribed at the high school level, so that may be a better answer for them. Um, don't have a great answer for middle school, to be quite honest. But at the same token, um, it's frustrating me to be putting money into pr to professional development attends events that people don't attend. Yes, Ms. Hennessy. Two things. I'd like to st thank you. That's, um, the PD is concerning. So I, as a district, want to philosophically, I think we need to support our teachers and fund PD, right? But the numbers are, are that was, Shocking to say the least. Of the, we have up, I'm trying to get what's not up there, but amazing. Um, Lisa Deeker, for example, who's an inclusion co teaching specialist, and that we don't have people attending it. I need clarity on that because that was that's something that I think I know where I teach that's a that's something that we want to go to. So that doesn't, I don't understand that. And then I, then I get concerned that the, this district for a long time, I'm pointing to you because you're a long time on this, have been fighting and making sure teachers get this. So can you, Lisa Deeker, zero people attending from certain schools, that just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me either. And I mean, I'll add to that, that we have a professional development committee that is authorized by the collective bargaining agreement. So these experiences, these topics, these presenters are the ones requested by the teachers. So this is, this is a menu of choices that teachers requested that they didn't go to. Um, so I really am at a loss to explain it. I, I really am. Some of these we even offered to pay people to go attend the training. 
So was this, I'm sorry for belaboring this, was this on a day that was their own time or was this on a day where they were? So combination, so combination. Some of these happened during school day and release time was provided somewhere after school and money was provided somewhere after school and payment was not provided somewhere in the summer. You can see there are a variety of different dates okay. there. So it was a mix of those. Right, and I, I can't say that any one jumped out as, oh, that's, that's the solution. Okay, okay, thank you. And then, so I, I think we need to provide PD for teachers. Um, and I know Bridge Street was very clear, teachers and families, about the BCBA, that they wanted someone and you're hiring that. Right. Yes. So how's the likelihood of that hiring? Is that like a real easy hire or do you think that's really a hard hire and we're going to not have someone there who would have been consistent or is that going to be something that you think is going to be? Is it, I, you know yeah, I can't make guarantees, but I would put it in the, the realm of reasonableness. Okay. It is a, it is a specialized position, but we have um, programs at local universities that are um, producing BCBAs. So I think that's a great move because that's something that they really Yes, Mr. Cobb. So I've prioritized my 30 down to four. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at this and I'm really um, trying to get a handle, and I can't do this in terms of what impact this has on our inclusion model, both short term and long term. So I think what would be really helpful for me is to, um, and, and how that reflects upon the budget, obviously, I think it'd be really helpful for, for me, and I think a lot of people that reached out to me to kind of see what the what this picture means within what this means for wins moving forward mm -hmm. so if i just focus on bridge for example i can see a number of added positions mm -hmm. i also don't fully get the 203 extra thousand to bridge whether that was covered in some of your previous slides or whether that's something new that sounds very promising and helpful but i'm not seeing how these decisions were made how they fit into a plan for not only bridge but for the whole district and I'm wondering, was that something that you plan to present in the future? You're thinking about wins and inclusion um, and what's happening at Bridge or what we have learned this, this past year at Bridge and how this fits into the budget for next year? Because I can't make those linkages easy for me. Just so I, I think if you look at this slide that I'm on right now, it, it shows the positions in the area of building <coughs> capacity to meet students' needs. Yeah. And you'll see that um, Bridge Street is the school that is more or less prioritized in almost every area, if not every area. Yeah. That is because the um, experience we had at Bridge Street this year um, showed us that there was a need for um, us to buttress staffing there in the next round of the budget. We didn't see the same kinds of problems at other schools, and so those schools had more modest gains um, in staffing. The one area that I think um, sort of addresses special ed and, and sort of the wins, um, so 2.0 if you want, is the special education ESPs, which are provided more or less at all schools. Um, one of the areas where schools felt light this year was in ESPs. We reduced some ESPs in order to get the teaching positions. When we had conversations about um, staffing this year and some of the challenges this year, we asked, would it be better to reduce teachers and buy more ESPs? And um, people were really clear that, no, that moving to teachers was the right move, yeah. but they still wanted to have additional ESPs. And so that's what we're trying to address in this, in this budget. I think, I think I see that. I see a lot of evidence of that, but I'm not, it's not coming across that clearly. And I think it would be beneficial to almost match that up and say, these, this is where we're going with wins. This is what our needs are for year two. This is mm -hmm. some of the le lessons that we learned and some of the adjustments. And this is the positions that we feel are gonna tackle that because they're gonna provide <coughs> such and such. Mm -hmm. I think that's critically important for the community to see that now. And for me, I'm very excited to see because I feel like I'm understanding what you're saying. It's just not coming across. I don't have your thinking in my head. It's sure. not reflective on paper. Is there a chance that you can do that for us? Yeah, this is just the first view budget. Sure. We'll be putting together a complete budget book. The budget book includes a budget message. It includes a lot of supplemental materials. That's something we certainly can add to help carry the message to the community. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd also just want to really compliment you on, A, the, the grants that you got. Those sound great. The, um, 
adding ASL, I did notice, I think, I think I saw that in the program of studies that UMass now accepts ASL as a, they require foreign language and, and ASL is one of them. Mm -hmm. Is that right? I believe, I believe that's true. The, the ASL is accepted by more colleges now? I'm not aware of that. I know that we're in There definitely are colleges. Sure. Okay. And, and I, took, um, I took ASL about 25 years ago, and um, it's such a visual language. It's such a different way of learning a foreign language. It's, foreign language is really difficult for a lot of kids. ASL is completely different. And for visual learners, it's an unbelievably effective way of learning another language. And I think more and more research now shows ASL has the components of qualifying as a foreign language, whatever that means, just as much as Spanish or Russian or French or whatever. So I think that's a great move. Um, I'm wondering also with, with what Anna had said about PD, you, you had talked about there'll be some changes in PD naturally to reflect upon those, the aspect that we're not recruiting as many teachers. But I do recall there were some required PD uh, with Barbara Love and her team and also maybe it was math investigations um, that we had last mm -hmm. beginning of the school year. Those were very expensive, and I'm just wondering whether that's something also that we'll be doing in the future, and if not, is that something that you would think about taking those costs and bringing <coughs> them into the school in the same manner that you're changing some of the other outside consultants so we can have uh, some in-house ongoing support? I presume the question is about the model of professional development rather than the those specific presenters. Yep. Um, we will, do still have two professional development days in our school calendar and in our collective bargaining agreements. Those two mandatory days will likely still be um, staffed by outside experts. Um, that is our opportunity to get teachers to outside experts. We think that's a very valuable thing. Um, so there is sufficient money left in the, the PD budget for those days. It's sort of these non mandatable trainings um, that we are considering or proposing cutting back on. I guess I'm suggesting is that while we're considering um, in a number of moves here, you're considering a note, you know, like the BC, the behavior consultant, and the other person, I forget what it was, of having, instead of that, exchanging that money from an outsider to inside, mm -hmm. have you thought about also exchanging those I think rather expensive mandated PDs, which I think a case could be made that they're incredibly valuable, but they're still just a, a three hour block for a lot of teachers. Is there a way that, is, have you thought about also in budgeting of replacing those funds with staffing in-house to have it more long-term and more consistent? And is that an opportunity, I guess is one of um, I guess I'll just give you my feelings about that. Yeah, sure. Um, we haven't had discussions about that and my, my concern is that, as I've shared um, with the committee in another format or forum, there is uh, a real skepticism of outsiders in, among our faculty that I think can be limiting. And I agree that the research on three-hour workshops is not good, that coaching you know, is able to provide a lot more. But there's a real danger of just sort of closing the doors to anyone from the outside. And so I think, um, I think for that reason alone, I would be reluctant to give up two days when we can bring in an insider and can deliver teachers, I mean an outsider, and deliv deliver teachers to the outsider. Um, I, to give that up, I think, would be the wrong move for us. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. The first is um, I appreciate how much you're listening to the community with the surveys and, and going out and listening to teachers and administrators and parents, but I'm wondering, um, is there something that you as an administrator think that we need that's not showing up in this budget? I'm not sure if your voice is in this or if you're taking their feedback and then kind of me measuring your visions, um, but I don't know what we're choosing between. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, if it were just up to you and you had extra money, you know, what, what is it that you think would be most important for us to be successful? Uh, I'll say that for me to just impose a budget without feedback would be the completely wrong way to go about it. So I wouldn't do that. But I, I will say that there were some choices made in the, the budget process that I felt disappointed by. You know, when we present these, I just present 
as a first among equals, not as a person with all the answers who's trying to say, here are the solutions, this is what I think we should do. Um, so I'll talk about some of those. One of the things we talked about was increasing preschool services. Um, we currently have a four-day program. We actually have a four-day program that's reaching capacity. I had a proposal to make it a five-day program by adding a teacher and additional ESPs, basically having the person rotate among our four classes so that families could have a five-day experience and kids could have a five-day experience. One of the things um, that we know is an effective countermeasure to the high needs future is effective preschool education. Um, but that was ultimately you know, voted down as too costly and not enough of a benefit, so I felt bad about that. Um, another thing we had, that I had talked about that was voted down was the idea of sort of a stabilization team um, because in every school there are periods of unrest. Um, it can be caused by a changing family situation, it can be caused by a changing medical situation. It's not um, a situation <coughs> where you can afford to provide on-site staff at all of the buildings waiting for a crisis for them to intervene, um, but the idea of a mobile um, crisis intervention group I thought um, had some merit. That also got voted down. Um, I am still pursuing that one because one of the thoughts that I've had actually um, based on a conversation with one of the, the committee members who was thinking in the same direction is if we can't do that at the local level, maybe we could do that through the collaborative. Because um, if you pool all the districts in Hampshire and Franklin County, you could definitely keep a crisis team busy. Um, so I'm trying to pursue that through a different um, model. Um, but the thing that I think I feel most um, disappointed about in the whole budget process is when we got to um, the afternoon of the third day of work on the budget, which I had called the horse trading session, the first thing that the elementary administrators put on the table was not adding an administrator to help them out. These people, this, and all of the administrative team is incredibly overworked. You know, I, there's this song, I forget what it's called, but I feel guilty every time I hear it. There's this line about um, Genghis Khan couldn't keep his troops supplied with sleep. That's how I feel about the administrators. You know, they're sending me emails at 12.30 at 1 a.m., and it's not right. Um, sorry. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that they took that off the table. I know why they did it. I admire them. They said if we have a choice between more of us or more teachers, let it be more teachers. But they did that at a cost. Um, and then my second question was just um, when we had um, added the visa program, we were going to be accepting, um, accepting some students. And I thought that that would bring some income into the district, well, into the high school. And I understand that was earmarked. But where are we with that? Waiting. Still I've waiting. All the light, the work totally set. I've done all the testing. We're <coughs> five. We're working with education. So now what it is is basically they know we're all lined up in terms of the ability to assign visas, and now we fall to them to do recruitment for students. They're selling us out there to, with their contacts internationally, and just trying to. We've done our part. We're ready to go. Right, but we still don't have money that would fund ESL or anything. Okay. Other questions or Mr. Meyer? So I had a question about the district stability plan slide, and I just wanted to know whether that had been updated to reflect the fact that in 2021 that it's likely that the city hits the same wall that we hit. And so the so we've we've I guess built the projections based on three percent or two point seven five, somewhere in there, uh, eight hundred and sixty-five as dollars. Um, so was that was that slide updated because if it wasn't, then that means that, that that last year looks, you know, if the city was just to tell us, look, absolute override, we're going to have to level fund you, then then all of a sudden our, our budget picture looks a lot different that year. 
That's right. It, it hasn't been updated to reflect any change in that, but to give you a sense of what it looks like, it's about $875,000 that you could subtract from any one of those bars. Right. It, it's based on the assumption we'll still get a 2.75% increase. So obviously if the city bottoms out, we probably won't get a 2.75. There had to be assumptions made to plug into the, all the background to that chart. Right. Thank you. Um, so two specific things then, Dr. Provost. Um, I know based on what you just said about the administrators being, especially elementary school, being overworked. Um, and you, you said before that there was a discussion around uh, an inclusion teacher or a math coach. So my specific suggestion is to potentially reconsider the Chinese teacher, which I like that idea a lot, mind you, but I wonder if that could be considered a point for inclusion or co-teaching specialists in that role, even though we're talking about a half a day at each of the four elementary schools, that would act actually alleviate some of the work that I know the principals want to do, which is be in the classroom and support their teachers. I think that might be something worth considering. Um, the other question I had was you talked about an academic support teacher being cut, and I'm just concerned. Is that somebody who supports kids who need help with the MCAS? What, what, what does that person now do, or what is that role now? I actually would defer to Mr. Lombardi to answer that. Sure. Uh, that's a teacher uh, that we had that was supporting students in their academics. Um, and, and basically a guided study hall would help them um, focus on their academic classes. Um, clearly at times there was a focus on MCAS, yeah. um, but it wasn't just geared specifically for sophomores. So it could be <coughs> a freshman. Typically there were students that were non-special ed. Yeah, so that's my concern. It was, you said it was for non-special ed, but when you made the presentation, Dr. Provost, you said with your increase in SPED that that would cover that. So I'm confused whether and concerned whether we're still getting those kids. The, the hope would be that, that with the new addition of another special ed teacher, we're looking to increase our ability for co-taught teaching as well. And co-taught classes don't need to be designated specifically for special ed. So that would, that would, that would uh, um, incre increase our capacity to offer co-taught classes yeah. um, with a regular teacher and a support of a specialized um, teacher, but we could have um, students that are not just special ed. So those students that might struggle that need a support, they might benefit from being in a co-taught class. Okay. I mean, I leave this to you. I know that where your heart is. I, I, are, you, are you at all concerned with the kids who need academic support losing this person given the exchange? I mean, this I is... Think, I think, again, it's, it's one of those questions in, in a perfect world. Yeah. Sometimes there's good decisions and, and, and there's brave decisions you do and then you, and you weigh things out. And I think that when we look at the resources we have and the capacities we have, I think this is, is building our capacity to meet more kids. Um, is it a perfect solution? No, but, but it is a better use of our resources that, we, that I think is gonna support the kids in a classroom. I think students are better prepared by being in a classroom supported with that content teacher. And if we can support them in a class, they're gonna develop the skills to have more success not only in that class, but also in other classrooms. I don't understand enough about that position, but for 16,000 or 19,000, if it, just asking you to rethink, if you really <coughs> think it's going to hurt a subset of kids who are getting a unique sort of thing, then I would question whether, I know we have limited funds, but for that amount of money, maybe we don't need to cut it. But I, again, I trust, I know you, I know where your heart is. If you think, if you think it's okay, it's okay. I just wanted to make sure that you had that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Elena. I actually had a question about the same thing. Sorry. <laughs> and we can come back up there. Um, the, the, so that academic support teacher, is there more than one teacher that falls into this category? Or are we like losing that class option? It, 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 was, two, it was two courses um, per semester. So we're losing that we're, course. Yeah. yeah. And what was the name of that course? Was it something? Academic support. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And so that's two courses. But what we're getting is six sections of um, a special ed teacher for our, we can add to six you know, co-taught classes. And so that, that would really increase our capacity to support kids. Again, not just, it's not just going to be special ed. And do you know about how many kids were enrolled per semester in this? I think overall might have been um, between 15 and 20, both semesters. So maybe 8 to 10. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Foss. <coughs> I'm just going to follow up briefly on what... Mr. Kaufman said concerning the Chinese. I think it sounds like it's a really neat opportunity, but I'm concerned that when we do have a lot going on with inclusion model and we want to put resources into that, is it better to put a little more resources into that and not into a new initiative 
Um, I like the idea of trying to share things with local districts. I like the idea of our kids being exposed to Chinese, but the concern is if we don't really have a plan moving forward for Chinese, kids might take it for a year, then what are we gonna do with it? Um, long term, I would love to talk more about introducing Chinese. I think it's a great language for kids, especially who have some learning disabilities along with ASL. Those are the two <coughs> languages that they, kids with dyslexia, for example, have an easier time with. So this isn't to say I'm against that, but to just have one little opportunity in seventh grade doesn't feel like that big of a win right now without a longer term plan for it. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for all the work you've done and how you've really turned, uh, you know, we have this, you know, really limited budget and yet you seem to have found all these kind of opportunities within it. And, and I thank all your administrative team too for all that hard work, really. Um, I was curious, I was, um, you know, it was uh, hard to hear, look at that slide about the disciplinary statistics. And I just didn't know how, it didn't seem to connect through to anywhere else in the budget. And I'm just wondering what your thinking is on how to tackle that issue, so. Well, um, you know, the slide said that the system disciplines kids at a higher rate because I think this is a systemic thing. I don't think that we have any teachers, administrators, or ESPs, or any employees at all who um, set out to try to create disproportionalities, and yet it reproduces itself every year. Um, so the anti-bias training that we're mm -hmm. doing now is intended to be one way of creating a new set of tools to look at that. Um, the good part is that we were able to provide anti-bias training for 100% of our staff. The last staff to be trained were athletic coaches who are trained today. The, um, the unfortunate news is that all we were able to do was the mandatory trainings. Um, there was some participation in some of the additional trainings. I know that um, all of our schools have taken it on as a focus in their, their school improvement plans, but you know, as we learned through our anti-bias training, we're dealing with deep-seated, often mostly unconscious biases that are hard to um, notice when they're operating. So the, the solution, which is crazy to call it a solution because it's a process that is so difficult and fraught and hard to do with fidelity, is bringing your biases to consciousness so that you can make more informed choices instead of just sort of operating on you know, your, your beliefs that you may not even be aware of. Um, so we'll see what happens when we get our discipline report for this year. We'll see if there's any difference. I know there have been some specific discussions about, um, about the current discipline um, profiles at some schools. I know that some schools are looking at their, their discipline saying it looks a lot like it did before and you know what can we do about it? And that's where um, some of the, the proposed remedies may be a little bit um, maybe a little bit off in my opinion but I think the fact that people are at least looking at the disproportionality and trying to question what's it coming from and how can we make it less um, puts us on the path to addressing it mm -hmm. so just to follow up on that is there some uh, I mean are there PLCs that have formed around it are you going to be bringing in will there be any more anti-bias training for the next year on those sort of mandatory days or I don't think we'll be repeating the mandatory training on the anti-bias training. Um, we did do follow-up training with um, many of the same individuals and um, sort of the feedback was that they had gotten to the, the end of their material and was starting to repeat. Um, the PLCs have, um, there, are, there are PLCs in the district, but it's small. You know, it's a number of maybe 10 PLCs <coughs> on a variety of topics so far with you know, a small number of teachers. So I, you know, we, we don't want to repeat the, we don't want to repeat the training we've already done. We don't want to offer more training that people don't attend. What we want to do is keep the conversation going. Ms. Fallon? Can I just um, ask you about, I know the North, because I'm the liaison, that the Northampton Education Foundation did fund a grant 
for the for yep. the um, working Real to eliminate people. racism for yeah. five thousand dollars. Can you tell us where that process is? I know they were doing an audit to to yep. kind of gather information about students and community members' experiences with racism and start working on a way to sort of combat that. And I wonder if this if that would shed some light on what's going on. So from the beginning of that project, we have been coordinating our efforts because we wanted to make sure that the um, strategies and approaches that we were doing through the official district training were reinforced or at least not counteracted by what was happening with the NEF grant. And um, I believe they're at the point now of getting close to um, having something to report out. Um, the goal was to gather student and faculty and, and parent experiences um, of racism in our schools, not to um, point fingers or not to you know create hostility, but just to raise awareness of what experiences some of our students have had. Um, so, uh, my my expectation is that they're they're moving towards something that I think will look somewhat like people of Northampton, um, but just you know vignettes of real stories from our local community of. Um, times when we got it wrong. Did you have a follow up to that? Well, no, but I just had another uh, comment. Sorry, well, I just wasn't you, you, quite done, but okay. all right, thank you. Sansky and <laughs> So uh, because I'm on the Budget and Property Subcommittee, we got a sneak peek of all of this you know, last week. And I shared this with the subcommittee, so I'll just talk to everyone else about it. But I'm really concerned about the one-to-one -one laptop program for JFK and then NHS next year. And I'd really like to um, urge you to reconsider it. I think we're, it's just moving too fast in a direction that I'm not really clear that, A, we can even sustain. I mean, when we look at the budget numbers, this is going to have a huge cost to our district. And we're going to have to make a choice to replace to upgrade, to deal with Wi-Fi issues, not to mention just the technical, logistical. We're talking about increasing staffing to be able to support this program. And I just think we're going to find ourselves in a position a couple of years. And now I know the one-to-one -one laptops are actually being would be provided through a capital through our capital budget through the city. So that initial $110,000 for JFK would come out of the capital budget from the city, if that's correct, yes. And then next year, I assume the same would have to happen for NHS maybe around the same hundred ten thousand dollars but i think we're going to just we're um, kind of backing ourselves into a corner where we're not going to be able to we're going to be making a choice between technology and teachers and i don't want to be in that position to make that decision first of all i think we're underestimating what the like logistical and technical challenges are around this when kids come to school and their chromebook is broken when the Chromebook has no battery power and a teacher is trying to teach a class to the whole class. I think there's just there's a lot there that um, I don't see any kind of plan for. And I'm also not really clear on like what the needs is that we know that some section of the population has laptops and computer at computer access at home and and others do not and so why are we providing every kid a laptop or a Chromebook in this case when every kid may not need that laptop or Chromebook. And then I'm also just concerned about the educational impact of this, that what I've been reading and seeing is um, that actually low-income kids, children of color, actually disproportionately hurt by having laptops at home, that their test scores go down. And you know, I can point you to screen, the movie Screenagers that Ms. Fallon and I bought, both went to see that talked about this research. Um, if you want to read the America's Real Digital Divide, an op-ed in the New York Times last week, it talks extensively about this issue. And you know, uh, the superintendent, Ms. Fallon, and I all sat through Dr. Bill Daggett's presentation at the um, mass conference where he talks all about the future of nanotech and biotech, and that's where we're headed, and that's that you know, our kids need to be ready for that and here's what he says are the top 10 skills to get our kids ready for this complex problem solving critical thinking creativity people management coordinating with others emotional intelligence active listening service orientation negotiation and cognitive flexibility none of those do none of those speak to the need for a one-to-one -one, uh, laptop program at the middle school or at the high school i am all for the benefits of technology, but I want to just be very clear about what is our what is our need and what is our plan before we start rolling out a one-to-one -one laptop program and would we be able to sustain this program? Because I think the costs of 
putting this into our schools are going to just, again, you know, put us in a very difficult position. And, you know, Mr. Meyer last weekend really shed some light to, on this subject for me by saying, by pointing out that I guess that children who take notes on laptops learn less than children who, or get less out of it than children who take written notes. So what exactly, what's our goal here and how do we want to reach that goal and is this really the best way to reach that goal? So that's my concern. Okay. Thanks. Ms. Hennessy, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I had a little time to prepare. That's actually so. Um, your comments on that at some point. Um, I know that what I'm going to ask is impossible or not impossible, not possible for right now. But in the future, I think it would be really useful to have a breakdown every week or every meeting. We have um, PTO donations and NEF and X amount of outside money, and I would love to see a breakdown of that on schools, the different schools. Because I, I've seen and we've commented here about some inequality uh, with respect to the monies given to these schools. And so I kept thinking some of these numbers seemed, um, they didn't mean as much knowing that this school got this donation and this school got this. So that and future discussions, and maybe that's something we should do, but to look at. Because I think it does have an impact. And then my last thing was I, w I was concerned about, I think Ludlow's a great district to look at with respect to our special needs population and the, num the amount that they, pay they spend more. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're, we, you know, we're not prioritizing, we, not we, are, we're not prioritizing education, so um, that's really the problem, right? But that was concerning. Okay. Did you want to address the Capital sure. I, I guess just maybe to have <coughs> heart to heart, I would ask because you and I have talked about this many times, right? And so I think I know and respect your deeply held beliefs, and, and I know that you do mine as well. So I guess I'll ask um, I can have the IT department prepare more information for the next version of the budget about how they plan to sustain it all the way through, but would that really change your mind, or are you really concerned about kids having more access to screen time at the bottom of the whole thing? Um, I, you know, I think that I kind of weigh both easily, equally. I mean, do you really believe that we can handle this budgetarily moving forward through the years? I do, yes. Okay, then I'd like to understand. I think it'd be useful to understand that better. And I don't know that this is the same issue as sort of with smartphones or cell phone usage, which I know I've spoken on before, but I do think it's a real issue of, well, I do think there's a needs assessment issue. So I think there's a piece of do we really need every student to have a Chromebook to take home when a lot of students already have um, computer or laptop usage at home, I think that's a real issue. And what's gonna be happening with these Chromebooks in the classroom and what kind of professional development are we gonna to need to provide because there's gonna be a huge amount of professional development to really make these Chromebooks come alive and become something more than just surfing the internet or you know writing, on a, writing a Google Doc, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think we don't want that. But I do worry about the you know educational impact and I, uh, not because necessarily, the, I guess we could put like the software clever on, so you know that it was just learned about that you know would only let would limit where they can go on the internet, so they wouldn't be playing games. I guess that's a certain amount of money, but you know I just wonder about really what's the educational value. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you saying yeah. you're potentially so, gettable with more information? <laughs> 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 <Okay>. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, my, my hand was up earlier about this a little bit too. I didn't know if we were going to continue the conversation, but I first heard about when I was listening to a school committee member uh, meeting from there <coughs> in the fall. I heard a mention of maybe someday we're going to have this one-to-one -one laptop that you've now presented, and seeing this was the first time I had heard of it was happening soon. And I share a lot of the concerns that were just articulated um, in a big way. And for me, I think it is a lot to take care of all those Chromebooks. And as a teacher, I think it could potentially be very distracting to have every student having one. Um, and I don't know what the, how the teachers 
from mm -hmm. seventh to twelfth grade feel and which ones want to use them and which ones don't but I think it's pretty complicated um, some kids are gonna have their own computers it feels really wasteful to me to send a Chromebook home to certain kids who already have a computer that they're using they all of a sudden have two computers um, but I'm also more just concerned about the more and more kids are reading on computers I you know I teach at the college level and my kids my students can't read a textbook and they don't and I read textbooks in class now with them and I think that's a really important skill and so this is a pretty big shift in terms of how students are learning there's definitely research that shows reading on a screen is a different process than reading in a textbook and writing taking notes on a screen is different than writing and um, sending a Chromebook home with kids is going to have a big effect on what they're doing at home and homework. So, so I, I definitely share a lot of these concerns. Um, adding to that, and this is perhaps a different topic, but right now our schools are all connected to Google. Everything our kids write, every email they send, Google owns it. And I, I think we should all be really, that should scare us, and it's because it's free. Google has given this to us for free. We don't have to pay to store this stuff. Um, and this Chromebook is just a step more in that direction um, and and it's a, it's a scary place that we're headed in my opinion okay. so I will provide more information at the next meeting I guess this is really a comment for the public not for the committee because I know that you all understand that but I think it's important for the public to know that if we if the committee votes not to do the one-to-one -one program it doesn't provide any flexibility in any other part of the budget because it's capital so that money will go to some other city department. I guess so just, I just, can I add a follow-up comment? Um, I, I guess I would really like the idea of making sure kids who don't have a, access to a computer and need one can borrow one from the school any night. To me, that's a no-brainer, and I think that's really important. Mm, yeah. But tying a lap book or a Chromebook to every kid 24-7, that's a much bigger step, and I, I worry they're going to spend more time on the screen than they are taking a walk after school. Um, so, Mr. Cobb. What would be helpful for me and, and maybe others is, is um, just a kind of a bulleted list of the benefits of this. What's the learning benefits? What's, you know, why are we doing this? What, what are we going to get out of it? What are kids going to get out of it? I think that would be a helpful sort of balance to Sure. some of the concerns which thank you for raising and again I just have to say like this is part of the capital process and I'm a little concerned because I'm presenting <coughs> a capital plan to the City Council on Thursday <laughs> this week uh, and these were all and so and I will say that the request from the school department for the one-to-one -one did include we require all departments to provide us with not just the cost of acquiring equipment but the cost to maintain it so that I think that is part of the mm -hmm capital request so um, okay uh, <laughs> mr. Meyer um, just want to pull back to a more global concern um, which is if you take the if you look at the city's um, the most recent stability plan update presented by the mayor at our joint meeting um, the projection is a three million dollar shortfall in fiscal 21 absent lots of people smoking a lot more marijuana or gambling all of their life savings in Springfield um, or other hopes like the fair share amendment um, and that some of the fair share amendment actually reaches Northampton um, you know, these are all contingencies if that shortfall exists I can't see a way that the city does any more than at best level fund us um, because that's at best what the city's managed to do in previous downturns. That takes us from having just enough money to pay our bills in 2021 to a $600,000 shortfall, um, which is 12 FTEs. Um, and again, this is a projection made when we're at 3.5% unemployment in the Commonwealth. We're in the third longest expansion <coughs> in US history. And so none of this planning involves a recession, um, which really concerns me. Um, I think it's, it's shameful, um, and it's made more poignant by the loss of Representative Cocott this week, um, that 
in the midst of this prosperity that we're getting $20 a student. And even in the worst of 2010, which is when the 2008 recession rolled through Northampton, we got $25 a student. So a 20% reduction. Um, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing to me in a, in a blue state, one of the first things out of the mouth of the head of, of our assembly is that revenue is off the table. I mean, I just hear that year after year um, from, from DeLeo. So I guess my concern is, in terms of talking about all of these initiatives as sustainable, is, is do we have contingency planning to turn, you know, to turn the boat before the iceberg is too close? Um, so, you know, again, my kids will be junior and senior in fiscal 21. So, you know, so it's, it will directly affect them. It will directly affect every student who's in the, you know, in the schools at that point from pre-K upwards. Um, again, Northampton has, the last two times we faced a crisis, passed <coughs> overrides to bail us out. And, you know, I'll work very hard for that again, but um, overrides, people have worked very hard for them before and they've also failed. So I guess that, you know, in terms of planning for this budget, I understand that every year you and your administrative team and every superintendent, every administrator who's worked in the district has done their very best to stretch every dollar to benefit students. And, and it's very hard to punish students in the here and now for the disaster that's coming. Um, but at the same time, <coughs> the, the impact is greater if you don't slow down. And as a physics teacher, there's formulas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I, I always urge students not to drive as fast because. So one of the things that we always um, end this portion with is getting a sense from the committee of whether we should go forward and put together budget books based on this. One of the the only contingency we have is to not go farther into, not go as far as we're going into the reserve. So it would be helpful for me to know if the committee says, no, not 200 and, or whatever thousand dollars it is, we want you not to touch the reserve, or we only want you to use $100,000. Bring us in a budget with that. That's the type of, you know, sense, or give us different scenarios going from zero to, you know, what you've proposed. That's the kind of sense of whether you want us to go with this one or whether you want us to bring back other stuff that, you know, is helpful for me at this point. People have a sense of that in terms of sort of what you were saying, Mr. Meyer, about the trajectory of our stability plan and whether it's sound or not. Um, I, I, I will mean, say that my mine, you know, was January and it's going to change. Right. It will change. There will be some change. <coughs> But the facts remain, and we've been pretty upfront about it, that it's a plan that's designed to forestall an inevitable cliff that is going to happen if there's not changes in other revenue sources, whether, you know, Chapter 70 or local aid or, or other local revenues. So uh, the math just doesn't add up. I mean, so unfortunately, the math doesn't add up at the state budget either these days, especially if you don't raise any revenue. Right. And they, they don't raise any revenue. Right. So, uh, I mean, no new revenue. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge. So the question is, you know, the plan that Dr. Provost has put forward, and it does somewhat mirror the city's plan because they're kind of woven. Is that trajectory, are people comfortable with that trajectory using, it's like 190, I think you have projected? 166. Or 166. 166. 166 of school <coughs> choice funds. <funding. coughs> To, to balance the budget. And again, the city will be using its its fiscal stability funds as well. Um. I don't know that this holds true on the city side, but on the school side, I feel like if we don't make these investments now, we will continue to lose students and we will lose more money to charter schools potentially. And so to me, we need to keep investing to keep our schools quality attractive choice and if we continue to improve them maybe we could actually even recover some of that money that's leaving the district um, and so I 
while I am very nervous, I am willing to support this level of dipping into the stability fund for this year. I would certainly support Ms. Fallon's comment and also Mr. Myers' comment as well uh, in regards to continuing to move the district forward and although we do want to minimize the, the harshness of the impact when it arrives to be able to continue to look at our programming and our students' needs and to continue to try to make gains even aware that just that, and we don't know all the factors that Mr. Myers spoke to. Uh, alternative funding will uh, show up over the next few years, but in the meantime, there are needs for our students, and we identified them in such a way that uh, it makes sense not only to make the additions to the budget this year, but also to, as the mayor on the city side and here on the school side, we made provisions knowing that um, the budgets will become tighter and tighter over time, but to um, do what any good house would do, um, put money aside for those leaner times and then spend in order to maintain and continue to grow <coughs> and in order to meet all student needs. So um, just what that number is, I'm not sure, but I, I do think that you've put some time into it and you feel comfortable with the hundred and sixty six thousand dollar number of taking from this stabilization and looking forward to future years to have enough there to continue to move forward and do the things that we would like to continue to do before we have to really look at how we tighten our belt and make um, some hard choices so I, I do support that Ms. Voss? Um, two slightly different things one just to um, agree with what my colleagues have said concerning the need to support the schools where they are. They've had a lot of um, needs this year, and I think our needs are great. And if we made additional cuts and didn't level fund and add some of the things you've very thoughtfully proposed, I think it would be a really big disservice to the kids. Um, I don't see a lot of anything in here, really, that feels like um, it wasn't thoughtful and isn't needed with a few very minor things that we've discussed. So I, I really I'm really happy to see all the support at the elementary level where it's clearly needed. I think the other support at the other schools is also needed. And as a group, it's great that we're acknowledging that we have this crisis coming up in a couple of years. It's important for the public to realize that. We've had success with overrides in the past. And while they're not always popular, and I know they're regressive in some ways. I wish we could have some sort of local income tax, and I know we can't, um, except <coughs> when some of our taxes are getting cut, as you mentioned earlier in the evening. Um, but I think we do have to look to the community and say, educating our kids is an important thing to the majority of us. People have voted for overrides for the last couple cycles because it's important, and the way Massachusetts set this up with prop two and a half says to communities we expect you're going to do this every once in a while and because we have a mayor who planned incredibly well from the last override that ask has been put off by a few years but i i think it's probably really important to just acknowledge that if we want to keep the schools where they are and improve some of the things that clearly need improvement we're going to need an override possibly and then just quickly i feel badly that the computer conversations coming up now I wasn't it I don't know in the process of moving forward when things like that come up how we can talk about it before we're sitting here and you need your answer in a week and you want your answer but I do really have some concerns and what is the way to have that conversation mm -hmm. um, not now yeah. Yeah. Um, generally there is a point in the in the year where the capital requests are brought forward to the committee that are going to be submitted to the to the city so I think I believe it was October or November this year yeah so it was probably predated your time on the committee but it was October or November so usually Dr. Provost and Ms. Walzak bring forward the list of requests that they're going to submit to the to me um, and so those are talked about then so that those would have been part of that list and then we go through a whole process so 
I know you mentioned it in the budget, but it's not really part of this budget process. Um, so. Yeah, so I would just add to it because I am the member to the Capital Improvements Committee and um, saw the request come forward, but was aware of it from previous <coughs> discussions and also um, from having it brought to the committee as those capital improvements are brought to the committee to be noted before they, they go to capital improvements of which I'm part of. So um, I am, as I'm sitting here tonight, I've been kind of silent ab about the, the one to one because when it was um, at least brought to and mentioned to the committee, there didn't seem to be so much kind of concern and dialogue on that evening. Um, I guess as the representative, I would have followed up on it more and tried to speak more to folks ahead of time because I was in full support of it. It was brought to the to this, you know, to the committee from the school department, and it seemed to me to have support because of the previous conversations. Um, but moving forward, as I'm on the committee again this year, I'll make sure that when the meeting is and those items are suggested that would be going to capital improvements, that I, I really have a good, solid understanding and consensus of the group that we support those. Um, because as the mayor shared and it was stated, uh, the investment that the city is making through capital improvements to the school department and the infrastructure of technology uh, is something that they've offered to uh, fund for the schools uh, for that purpose and that purpose only. So if we identified something now and wanted to ask them to reallocate those funds, it's not how it works. So they've offered the $110,000 for the, uh, the computers. If we don't want it, then the city will take the money back and, and use it in some other way, but it may not necessarily be for the school department. So. Uh, it's not a good reason to take money and waste it if we think it's not necessary or harmful to our students here in town. Um, but it does make me think that uh, moving forward in future years, when our school department really uh, <coughs> depends on the generosity of the city through capital improvements to help with certain items, that we really get what we really want and not be confused or have questions about um, things that have already been granted through the process. And again, this is, just, again, to be clear, um, capital uh, program is funded not with recurring revenue. It's with one-time money. So this is not operating monies that's going to be diverted to, you know, the police department or the DPW. It's, this is one-time money um, that you sp spend once and it doesn't come back next year. So just to be clear, we're talking about a separate item. Mr. Meyer, did you have? No, okay. Yeah, Ms. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just quick. Uh, thank you for saying that. I don't re remember that. That doesn't mean anything, though. Sure. Because I'm 52. But <laughs> I, I, I think that 52. when I'm thinking capital, I, I'm in my head. I'm like, oh, this is a nice, you know, chunk of money for a roof or computers. I think this, in my head, affects curriculum and policy. Mm -hmm. That for me requires a different kind of conversation that I, I wasn't thinking about some of the things that were mentioned. So for me, that's the only reason that I understand how it came up and I'm sure we have that. But um, for some of these things, computers being one of them, it overlaps too much for me with curriculum and policy. So, but thank you for saying that. And I agree, it's a great amount of money. Yes, Ms. Fallon. I was just gonna say, I, I did find the document. It was the November 9th meeting um, that it was presented by Ms. Waldeck. It was at the end of a long meeting, though. That's where all my presentations <laughs> are. <laughs> I don't remember it. I just wanted to be clear that, that you're telling the truth. People at the beginning of the agenda should all remember. She should really be, yeah, at the top of it. Just a, a quick question in terms of computers. If, if we continue to think about them, is, is it <coughs> allowed to purchase computers for the schools but not make them one-to-one, -one, so have them available for loan in a more broadly um, varied set of schools and, and maybe also consider providing, I know some teachers' classrooms at some of the schools have incredibly outdated computers um, and just looking at what the computing need is in a broader sense. I don't know if that's within what 
the money was granted for, but it's just a suggestion to think about. Okay. So you know, part, well, I think we're going to have um, we're going to have Ms. McLaughlin speak to this. She's so our hi, I'm she's our speaker <coughs> tonight. Who's been sprinting back and forth? I'm the digital literacy and computer science coordinator, and I've been pushing back there because I think I can help with some answers to this. So, just as a back story, my background is in art, and so that seems in some ways very far removed from technology. But <coughs> I also did disability studies, which gives a nice overlap for all of these things, and so. A couple of things that um, I can directly answer, you know, obviously having not prepared, but I expect based on some questions I'll be able to come back again. One of the questions was how to sustain this, and so uh, the cost of Chromebooks is significantly lower than the cost of a desktop to computer in the classroom. One of the things that we're looking at on a long-term range is like overall this plan, and so we talk about having students being available and ready and prepared for the future where it takes you. So one of the things is computational thinking skills, creativity, and all of that. I absolutely support 100% that the expectation of these computers is not to supplant the teacher, and it's not meant to be like here is every day you come in and this is exact you're going to sit down on a computer all the time. I like to think of this and frame it when I look at the instruction and the successful instructional use of technology is this is a tool in your toolbox. So for some students, this tool becomes something that's used on a regular basis because that's what allows them access to the content. So for some students, they have to, in order to read on screens, they cannot read a textbook. That, that language is not accessible. So this is hugely a game changer for some students. Equally, there's the piece for me, like when I was in college, I used to take notes in like three different colors all over because it was like, this is my brain needs to visually remember this. I also used to fall asleep every single time I had an art history class. And if it weren't for my computer recording that lecture where I could write some notes in, fall asleep, wake up again, write some more, and it was recording the lecture and I could go back and see where I fell asleep, I probably wouldn't have gotten that degree or at least wouldn't have looked so good in that one. But it's really meant to be a tool. Now, I look at some classrooms. Here at JFK, I was a tech integration specialist. And one of the reasons that we're looking at the one-to-one -one program, which again, if you think of it as one-to-one, -one, that maybe it's the branding that's kind of turning you off. If you think of it more as here's a computer <coughs> that may be used at some times to support or enhance your educational experience, that might be a better way of thinking of it. Right now, we're going through a really extensive process. We meet like every week as a team. We're looking at all the concerns, all the things we think we need to prepare for. Tomorrow I'm going on a learning walk at, at a community over in Milford, Massachusetts to see how they rolled it out. I'm looking at elementary, uh, middle school, and high school. But one of the things that I saw when I was here at JFK is the ability to see the tech integration go from, they call it, it's called this SMAR model, where it's a substitution which says, okay, instead of writing your story <coughs> by hand, use a computer and type it. It's a tool, and for some students, that's fantastic. But then you move into the more augmentation, and really, when you're using it as a device that you couldn't have been able to do something before. So take, for instance, in um, Cindy Maggio's class. She's a, I think, first grade teacher. The other day, her students were doing a presentation on polar, or polar bears, and it was a nonfiction presentation. And the kids, they did their research, they did their facts, they could have done that by books. Some of their students really needed to access the computers because there's a lot more, uh, language learners in the program, and so there's a lot of different extensions that will help convert some words that are complicated in English for those students to access that research. And then each of them came and they presented, and they gave their little speech. And so one of the neat things about it that they wouldn't have been able to do without technology is they did their research, then they did their presentation, and they did it where they filmed with a green screen behind them, and they had polar bears moving behind it. And so each of the little kids came up, they recorded their facts, and they were so excited. This video is not that long, but it's like one of these things that took that learning experience up a level. And that's kind of the tie-in. Or you look at something with um, in the history <coughs> uh, in the social studies department here, where they have a blog, and you can go in and you can you know like you might have access to your materials, so that now if you missed a class, you know what was happening in that class. It might be access to I know I often do like here's how to make a Google form. I'll put a video up. I'll put a handout up so that I'm trying to meet the diverse needs of the student population so that if you are in a situation where, like um, Mr. Kaufman was saying, like more visual learner, well, in a class, maybe that speaking isn't really working for me. Obviously, you could tell I fell asleep a lot in art history, which was 90% speaking. But 
maybe it was the visual tie-in. And so having that video to support what I was learning in class and having this idea of stations where, yeah, maybe you're working one-on-one -on -one with a teacher. Maybe you're working in this station to meet that, that need of yours. Like your learning style is this way and the teachers use the technology as an accommodation in that way. So I encourage people to think of it not so much, and I can totally like, next time I'm sure I, um, I can give you more very specific, but those are just off the top of my head. Not so much as like, yes, here's one extra thing to drag home in a book, you know, like another thing in the backpack for you to drop or whatever, um, more screen time. Because I especially am very conscientious of my day screen time. And so taking the time. Today I had an hour between, I think, one meeting and then this meeting. I went and did a walk. You know, I might have updated the website with three items too right before the walk. But like just that encouragement of, you know, at, at Ryan Road they have Forest Fridays. The kids are outside and they're playing. And so it's really teaching in this world that is gonna be technology laden that you need to find that balance. And this is, this for some people is a tool that's gonna demand access for that, or is going to allow them access. But for other students, this is an avenue to creativity that maybe they weren't able to access just in a more traditional sense. One of the things with the Project Lead the Way it, that um, John had mentioned was that it's really designed as a way to think of creative problem solving. And so uh, one of the schools we went and visited that had this program, they had like blocks, building blocks, and it was like you have 30 blocks. You put them together in six different combinations, you come up with the ways that they get together and make one full cube. That didn't involve a, a computer at all right away. Where it involved the computer was later when the kids got to print their designs using a 3D printer. But what it taught was that idea of you need to think of instead of, hey, what is the answer to this problem? You need to think of what are multiple answers to this problem because that's what the workforce is gonna want. They're gonna want those creative thinkers. And I 100% agree that like adding extra computers necessarily to people who have them maybe isn't a good fit and that's not necessarily the primate of this program. So one of the things we're looking at with the middle school next year, again, we're in the very like preliminary like talking about phase, is having it so only the students that need that access bring it home. But it's a tool in the classroom, just like the textbook is a tool in the classroom, just like the smart board's a tool in the classroom, that is there for you if that's going to support or enhance your educational experience. And one of the challenges of my team is to make, that, that make the experience for the teachers and for the students be one that is more that using the, that as a tool when you wouldn't have been able to do something or learn something without having it, as opposed to just the substitution, here's busy time, and we did a survey with the teachers and one of the concerns was the off-task behavior and so we're looking at ways that we can manage that. So that's just some things that might help answer some of the questions so that it doesn't become as much like everybody has it and it's bringing it home and they've got, you know, I have like four computers right now at home. I don't even know how it happened, but it happened. And so for, I wouldn't need to bring one home. But for some students, the loaning program today, I, I was working on MCAS stuff here, and I had a student run in because one of her signed out sheets for the, our loaning program at JFK didn't get processed in a computer. She really needed a computer tonight, and I was like, does she need it tonight? Like, is it important to what she needs to get done? And for her, it was. And so her parents signed, you know, signed the paper, and the kid went off with one of our loans. And so that's where the excitement comes. Is that student then, if, if her sister was sitting in the car with a laptop in her, in her lap doing something, and then that student didn't have to fight with her sister to be like, okay, after dinner, you get an hour, I get an hour. Like, it's kind of that tool. I yes, go, yeah, please. I was curious because I knew that there was a loaning program at JFK, and so um, uh, I guess my question is like how like how do you see that as different? I mean, it seems like sure. And so essentially, what it is is right now, and even when I was in this building full time, uh, what would happen is there was never a day that the Chromebook wasn't needed. Yeah. There would often be arguments amongst teachers because <coughs> they really needed it, kind of, you know. And so the idea is is the having the availability of computers for all students. So when it, we say one to one, instead of thinking it as it is, this is mine. You could think of it more as when I'm in the building, if part of my instruction requires use of technology, that's available. I don't have to compete for that. And in addition, so like the older machines that are in the rooms right now, this is for like the three machines, let's say in one classroom, we could afford a, like 12 Chromebooks. So now we're at a half class versus three students that have access. 
So it would allow the difference being it could have a similar feel. So there are like, I think we have five at JFK right now to loan out. But this would be like, we would know ahead of time which students needed that access and they could have the parent fill it out so that they could choose to take it to and from. But those who don't need that don't need to take it to and from. Does that help answer some yeah. questions? Mm -hmm. And then I'm sh I mean, I'm happy to come back with like more like specific examples beyond off the top of my head. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Can I just say, you just experienced an example of I don't come to this process and say, here's your budget. <laughs> um, um, I, I'm so blessed to work with a team who can answer your questions in the way you just heard answered. It happens all the time. Um, it happened for two and a half hours before she took her walk uh, at the end of the day today. Okay. So, Dr. Provost, do you feel... Do you <coughs> I, I had gotten feedback from three people on whether or not they felt comfortable with us just building the budget, sort of keeping us going, and then we got into technology. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So, I just had one question, and it's just it's lingering only because of the times which we're in right now. Um, it has to do with school safety, and so as I saw you presenting the budget and being part of um, Capital, <coughs> I know we've gotten generous donations from the police department and others um, throughout the years for surveillance equipment and certain locks um, and securities around the school district, and I'm I'm just wondering. Um, with next month coming and more attention being uh, placed on school facilities and secured buildings and what the government might be asking us to do and then what individual cities and towns and school districts might choose to do for their, their own safety or changes. Um, if any of your thoughts around budgeting for the upcoming year or future years included anything around uh, security which may be as simple as looking at uh, different lock sets for doors or access points or anything like that. I don't know if it's appropriate for this evening's discussion or not. But. I um, would be surprised if this topic doesn't come up on the regular March school committee meeting. So okay. I, think, I think we'll talk about that for sure then. Um, as you point out, we don't talk about tactics or methods in public because Part of the security process is keeping them shielded from potential intruders. Um, I can tell you that we talked about, um, this is something that we're always um, talking about, thinking about how we can re refine. There's certainly um, tragedies that bring these issues to our forefront of our mind and cause us to really focus in a way we don't, don't normally do on those issues. Uh, in terms of the budget, the big question really is, should we put security staff in the budget? My feeling is that I, I don't believe that, that the community would support that. Um, I think we'll be talking about that in March and talking about whether there should be some kind of a forum to discuss um, whether we need to implement other kinds of measures. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll save a little, I'll just save that for March. I mean, what the, the big budgetary question was, should we, in, invest in teachers and ESPs and licensed staff, or should we invest in security personnel? And we really didn't have even any thought that it would be right to, to direct these funds to additional security. <coughs> I do want to say that there there is security-related stuff in the capital program over the next five years, mm -hmm. upgrades to, to various systems and security systems. That is also part of that request that's going forward. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moore? Yeah, I, I just wanted to speak actually in support of the um, Chinese idea. Um, again, was, what, what triggered me to do that was this conversation about technology. I think, that, again, in terms of, you know, the, the world kids are going to be going into is not likely to be less and less, well, more and more insular. It's likely to be more and more involved in other parts of the world. and. And, and while I agree with what you said about we don't have a full-scale plan going forward and it's actually really hard to do when you look at the um, you know, financial picture, but I think in many ways we need to, you know, we need to you know, some sort of a way behave as though it will continue. we will continue to exist and grow going forward as opposed to the opposite where we just you know, 
put up the, <laughs> you know, say, nope, this is it. What we have now is it, and we can't do it. And so I, I think in terms of, in the scheme of things, I think that's like the lowest cost sort of way to, to start to entertain what that would look like. And, and in a way, that's almost a plus for it in the sense that it's not a long-term commitment and it's not a sole commitment of ours. And we're not, you know, we're not asking somebody to, <laughs> a person to come and be our Chinese person and then um, without any promises for the future because we know it's, it's tentative all around and, and I think that's fair. I think it's okay, but I think at least as a symbolic thing, I think it's really valuable to do some things that are actually looking to the future and looking to what's maybe more possible. And so I would support it. Other, um, so other comments, uh, Mr. Kaufman? So I, I um, appreciate all of this, uh, Dr. Provost. I, um, I'll, put, I'll throw my hat in there as I, I think we're heading in the right direction. I think for me, seeing the numbers would make will make a big difference. Um, and I think I've made my points pretty clearly about what I would hope to see that would really enhance um, the nature of the budget and the, the different aspects to it. I'll add, I, I agree with Howard as well in terms of Chinese, even though I had an alternative idea. But with that said, I wonder whether it's time to revisit the foreign languages that we do offer and potentially offer Chinese in lieu of potentially another foreign language. And this might be the groundwork for stating that forward. I think I have five. Okay. That are leaning okay. us doing this, so. <laughs> Count me in. Count me in. Oh, it's like okay. Be in, Dr. Sorry, Take a vote. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Um, now we um, have reserved some time here uh, on the agenda uh, that normally is the beginning of the agenda for public comment. Um, we did have two people who signed up for public comment. Um, actually, Mary McLaughlin uh, signed up for public comment. <laughs> Unrelated, but sort of. So, hello. <coughs> Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I, my name is Molly McLaughlin, and I'm the tech coordinator, although I gave you my longer title earlier. But tonight, I do represent the administrative leadership team. And the budget that you have heard presented this evening by Dr. Provost has come about through a collaborative process involving parents, staff, teachers and administrators. Leaders from each school and each department came together and closely reviewed both the qualitative and quantitative responses provided in the superintendent's budget survey, as well as through the various meetings and public forums conducted in the fall. And the feedback provided by staff, students, and parents really helped guide our discussions and inform some of the decisions that the leadership team has made. Pub public school systems are in fact systems, just like the computers that I tinker around with daily. A system works best when all of its parts move in harmony one with another. This is how I would describe the leadership team, team's approach to the budget process. As a group, the members examined the needs of the whole district pre-K to 12. Many ideas were presented and many reflections were had as to how each idea would best benefit all of our students. In coming to the final decisions we made as a group, consideration was given to each student's experience across their school career pre-K to 12. We have grown over the past few years, increasing our special education staff, adding tiered support specialists to the elementary and secondary levels, and increasing our students' access to technology. We continue building our capacity, our building, building our capacity to meet the needs of our students year after year. We are on a positive trajectory, and I look forward to participating in and absor observing the continued success of the Northampton School District. So thank you. Thank you. The uh, next person that signed up is Lindsay Sabatosa. Lindsay still here? Yes. <coughs> it's much later than I thought it was going to be. Mm. <laughs> um, so I'm here tonight as a parent of a future Northampton High School student. I was really no. interested, I'm s what happened? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so I watched um, with interest the committee's discussion about adding to the Northampton High School graduation requirements. And especially after listening to the discussion tonight, I have such faith 
that this committee is going to have a very thoughtful discussion about that um, and avoid rushing to make any decisions that will impact students. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing how the committee examines both the long-term and short-term implications of changing those requirements. Um, but what I really want to say is that I'm so grateful that the committee has a student representative on it because that's the, the community that's going to be directly impacted. And I look forward to hearing how the committee responds to her input and how she's going to share the perspectives of the students because th that's really what's most important here. So um, I just wanted to thank you and I look forward to hearing what you decide. Have a good evening. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Yes. If you could just state your name and address for the record. I'm Elizabeth Bowen and I live at 95 Stra Avenue. Um, so I didn't come planning to comment but generated a list as everybody <coughs> else was talking. Um, I um, just wanted to throw out that as someone who will be the parent of someone who's in pre-k and someone who's in second grade at the end of that chart that shortchanging kids um, needs now for the idea of long-term budget planning is kind of like not getting your physical and missing an expensive health problem. Um, kids have special ed and ESL needs now and if we don't do everything that we can to address those needs it's not like those needs go away. They get more complicated and more expensive to address. Kids who don't have their educational needs met in elementary school are more complicated and expensive to educate in middle school and high school. So not only are we shortchanging those individual children, but the idea of cutting things to save money for financial reasons backfires and backfires potentially tremendously um and as I said like my kids will just be starting out at, the, at that point um i wanted to throw out that i know that other students who have um chosen to come back from the high to the high school from the chinese immersion charter school have been able to continue their mandarin education um through the high school's relationship with smith so that is something that we already have in place that supports um, Chinese language learning. So there is that um, component already there as we're looking at what the potential long-term uh, effects um, are there. And just in terms of preschool, like I absolutely, <coughs> as I said, I think all of those things that are up there are very, very important. Um, but as the mother of a three and a half year old, I will say I, I'm listening to my friends talking about their towns that have five day pre-K where they can send their kids there from 8.30 to five and it's their childcare. And my friends who are school choicing their, their children into districts who have those preschool programs. and. So I would just ask that if at some point we are looking at adding preschool that we might want to look at whether we might gain um, school choice students either from other districts or students that we may currently be losing to districts that have more comprehensive pre-K uh, options. Um, and the last thing, just quick, um, um, Anne Hennessy brought up the PTOs and the fundraising. And I, I thank you for that, because that's something that I think gets overlooked a lot. Um, we've talked a lot this year comparing the demographics of the schools, the elementary schools across the district in terms of students with disabilities and students who receive free and reduced lunch or are economically disadvantaged. But that doesn't account for some of the other income discrepancies that aren't covered in that and some other districts can break it down by zip code and we don't have enough zip codes to make that useful 
but there is there is an income difference between different schools. We also have a size difference. Some of our elementary schools are 100 kids bigger. And if your PTO is trying to fundraise for computers or books and you've got 100 more families, your capacity to compensate for any budgetary shortcomings is different. And I hope that we'll be thoughtful as a district about what gaps and discrepancies that could lead to. I think that's the end of my list. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Elizabeth. Hi, my name is Lee Graham, uh, 89 Marion Street. You've all heard from me a lot in the last few months, so um, I also didn't have prepared remarks, but I wanted to say um, thank you. It sounds like you're listening, and I really appreciate that. <coughs> Um, I really, um, in terms of Lonnie's questions about plans, I think that there's a lot of um, energy in, among parents and um, among the PAC uh, that's slowly revitalizing around planning. And so if this can be a district-wide or community planning process, thinking about some of these inclusion needs, this high needs future, I think that there would be a, a whole range of stakeholders interested in that. Um, I'm pro-Chinese language, I agree. And uh, I teach at a um, Hispanic-serving, minority-serving institution. I teach at CUNY in, in New York. And we have many students who are first-time college, um, hun over 180 languages. We make this big speech at graduation every year. So um, we're always thinking about technology, access, disability, but also things like free and low-cost textbooks, other ways to access information. So to the extent that Northampton is preparing students who come from low-income backgrounds who are going to get to college and have not only technology questions, but also questions about textbook affordability, how to access um, information, all of these kinds of questions you guys were just debating, there's a future for them that these questions are going to still be out there. So to the extent that the IT and uh, the computers make this a more accessible education for them long term. I think that that's really important as well. We have all of these conversations that you guys are having um, at my institution as well. We did lend our graduate students iPads and it was not that successful and it's kind of expensive. So I think it is worth thinking about what they're using these machines for. But um, certainly thinking about the way that they can get information and stuff is very important. So anyway, thank you. Hi, my name's uh, Ronnie Gold. I'm uh, 15 Linden, Linden Street, Northampton. I'm a Bridge Street parent and also on the school council at Bridge Street and also a public school teacher down in Springfield. Um, was coming initially thinking whether I would talk about another point that I'll bring up in a little bit, but I did want to just, res which was non-budget related in a way, but I did want to respond to the budget and share that I greatly appreciate uh, how responsive the budget does seem to um, what teachers and parents and schools are requesting, and so that was great to um, see. Um, regarding the conversation about the technology, I just wanted to share, I mean, I'm also I'm a Google certified teacher. I'm a, I presented at Microsoft conferences and um, actually in Springfield, we're one to one beginning in third grade. Um, all our third graders all the way on up have their own devices and it's incredible what a teacher trained to <coughs> use those with students can do to transform the learning in the classroom. And so a big piece of that does become the training for the teachers and the device for the teacher. Because in many ways, you need the teacher to interact with the student's devices. Um, the ability for a teacher from their device to disseminate one assignment that is for ELL students, that is for special education students, that is for uh, gifted, uh, gifted learners instantly, and those kids learning at their own levels um, without everyone knowing it. The kid has the privacy of it being their screen is incredible. And so I would just ask, if maybe it is in the plans moving forward, but giving teachers a device as well so that they can have a one-to-one -one in a way that they can uh, work with their students. It also professionalizes the profession for the teachers. So it's just something to think about. Um, but uh, the other main point I wanted to come for was just regarding um, the recent tragedies in Florida. And um, I greatly appreciated uh, the call that we got and I read the letter and how proactive we're being. Um, my job in Springfield in the morning is to open the door and let 
hundreds of children into the and welcome them out of the cars and parents every <coughs> day can tell you how many are asking how is our school safe and I can imagine principals and teachers are getting the same questions and so I do think that some sort of a forum some sort of a more conversation with families to discuss with them whether it's public information or not just something um, to get that shock and that fear um, out of us is, is important. Um, I also, having a pre-K and a first grade teacher, first, sorry, first grade student, uh, pre-K and a first grade student, I'm just, I want to make sure that for those families that are trying to protect their children from even thinking that reality exists, that whatever actions get taken even at the elementary level, that those kids don't start to ask and be exposed to it because I know their families are trying to prevent their kids from even knowing that is a reality. And so I just hope that we take that into consideration. But yeah, thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move into the next agenda item, which is a second reading and vote on the graduation requirements for policy IKF revised. And I will turn it over to <laughs> they're abandoning <laughs> they're abandoning you <laughs> <laughs> yes. what are they protesting <laughs> so Ms. Fallon do you as the chair of the rules and policy do you want to just remind us uh, about <coughs> this vote we started to discuss it last time and it was deferred to this meeting Yes, um, so this is the second meeting and vote of amending policy IKF, the graduation requirements at Northampton High School to include um, one visual or performing arts course, one credit as designated in the program of studies to be effective for the class of 2022 and subsequent, subsequent classes. Um, since the last time we've met, now we also have the additional budget information showing how much our community values the arts and our student representative, thank you, provided us with a survey of 101 students at the high school to get their thoughts on this additional requirement. <coughs> so I would move that we accept policy IKF as amended. Second. Did you, um, Elena, did you want to give us a synopsis? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so uh, I surveyed a whole bunch of English classes in the week before break. Um, I chose English classes because these are classes that <coughs> every kind of student is required to take. Um, every year you're required to take an English class. So I wasn't getting specifically art students or specifically non-art students. Um, I, I intentionally submitted primarily written feedback to you all because to be quite fair with my what, with what I learned in AP statistics, this was not <laughs> quite a representative sample because I was sampling more juniors and seniors in order to get that AP and regular aspect than freshmen and sophomore. It was also a little larger than, of a sample size than I would have liked, um, and it wasn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily stratify it by arts or by non-art students. So this is for written feedback so that the committee can get a sense into, okay, what is the what is the rationale behind what students think rather than trying to give you like a 55% of students think this or that kind of thing. Um, just kind of what might not have included what I did find and what I found interesting um, was that the vast majority of survey respondents had taken arts courses, um, like practically all of them. Um, but there was still a large portion, like almost about half, that said that no, that they didn't want this requirement. Um, so I think that it's important to look at that, that it's not necessarily art students or students who have taken arts courses are pushing for this requirement, um, that there is that larger question that's on students' minds about should we be requiring this and what effect would this really have on our student body. Um, I, th I mean, you all have read these, um, but I think just to really quickly break it down for you and for the people here, um, the students that said yes, um, that they want this to be a requirement, um, the biggest thing that I found was their concern about funding for the arts um, and that students do not want funding for the arts to be cut. Um, I don't know if the best way to go about that is making the arts course a requirement. Um, it's funding for the arts. I, did, I don't know if that's necessarily tied to having it be a requirement. That's 
what I'm trying to get at here. Um, the other thing that I found students talking about was this aspect of Northampton High to some extent being a, a stressful or um, intensely academic focused environment. Um, which I think speaks to school culture and maybe a larger conversation that we'll have on a student union level with our administration. Um, but that even though the vast majority of students have taken an arts course, there is still this sense that Northampton High um, is, an, is an academically driven school and that that somehow provides a stressful environment. Um, because so many students have taken an arts course, though, I, I can't say that have mandating students to take one arts course will solve that that idea of having a and that sense of having a stressful environment at Northampton High. Um, in terms of the students who said no, um, their biggest principle was that choice was valuable, that students should be trusted to make these decisions for themselves. Um, also this concern that you know there's not a lot of courses per year, that we get eight per year and that students want to be filling those with things that they are interested in and motivated to take. Um, and then even I had some students who were saying, uh, I, I think some students were aware of that there was this argument that, oh, if we take more arts courses, we can minimize that stressful environment or that academically focused environment. I had a few students even say that it would be more stressful for them to be required to take a course that you know, maybe they're really not good at art and to um, be pushed to that level of needing to take it on the high school level might stress them out even more. That's another perspective to provide. Um, I also heard from a few students, you know, at JFK, I remember taking a, a wonderful span of like four or five, five week periods of all different kinds of electives. And I, I've never been musical, but I took a music course because that was a requirement at JFK. And I, <coughs> and I was exposed to that and I learned something from it. And I think that some students feel like, you know, once you get to Northampton High, um, there's this level of choice there and that at JFK you really have that aspect of being exposed to a lot of different subjects um, but that at Northampton High maybe there should be a little bit more choice. Um, if there are any questions anyone has about the survey or some of the responses or any sort of student feedback I'd be happy to answer. I don't have questions so I'll pause but I have some <coughs> comments. <here. coughs> okay. But I want to let people ask only any questions. Any questions first? Any questions? Any? Um, I mean, we had a good discussion about this at the last meeting. We just wanted to delay it so that we have a chance to get more feedback. Um, so we can move uh, into comments, probably. If you want to. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so I think mine's feedback. I I spent a lot of time thinking about this over the last few weeks, and I appreciate having had that time. Um, and I just have three areas I want to reflect on based on our discussion that we had two weeks ago. Um, the three are, the first is aligning with the mass core requirements, which was the reason I was given when I asked people, when I first asked why are we talking about this. Um, the second area is this idea of a well-rounded education, and it's related, I think, to the block schedule, as was brought up last time. And the third area is the effect of the proposed requirement on access to the arts. So Mass Core, it was said that an arts requirement brings us closer to aligning with the Mass Core requirements. Here are some facts that have influenced my current thinking. A majority of high schools in Massachusetts do not meet Mass Core. Based on data from the Mass Department of Education online, it appears that about 47% of public high schools meet Mass Core. Of particular local interest, neither Longmeadow nor Amherst meet Mass Core. Mass Core would require several additional courses not currently required at Northampton High School. In addition to an arts requirement, to be aligned with Mass Core, we would need to increase our math requirement from three to four classes, change our current requirement of three science courses to three science courses all with labs, and add two foreign language courses while we currently require zero. Thus, aligning with Mass Core would require a major overhaul of current Northampton High School um, requirements. So that was my first reflection. My second one is this idea of a well-rounded education. Some, some committee members argued in favor of an arts requirement because it ensures a well-rounded education. At the same time, 90% of Northampton High School students are taking an arts class suggesting there's not a crisis that we need to solve in an expedited manner regarding the arts. Also, we don't know why the remaining 10% are not taking arts, and that seems like an important information to have before imposing a requirement. A, a discussion about a well-rounded education would presumably also include discussion about requiring a foreign language, 
which far fewer of our students pursue and is also a requirement for students to access the Massachusetts four-year college system. Related to a well-rounded education in the arts and foreign languages, we also need to acknowledge that our block schedule limits student flexibility. And this, I think, speaks to a lot of the student comments. Um, students are required to take 16 credits, leaving 12 to 16 elective choices. While this may sound like a lot, some students have to take learning strategies every semester, which would effectively mean they have 24 required classes. Students interested in reaching the most advanced math class offered at Northampton High School have to take seven math classes. Many students do take three to five units of foreign language, which is expected to, for admission to some colleges. So as a result of both actual requirements and different educational pathways, many students really have only a handful of true elective courses remaining. And so for this reason, again, I think a broader discussion of all of the requirements is warranted before adding another one. And finally, my third comment regards access to the arts. I think it's a mistake to claim that voting for or against the proposed arts requirement is equivalent to either supporting or not supporting the arts. Supporting the arts includes ensuring students have access to opportunities required to excel and find their passions in the arts. At the last meeting, we were told that an arts requirement wouldn't require additional resources because only 20 extra kids would need to take an arts class each year. However, it feels more consideration and thoughtfulness is appropriate to anticipate the consequences of how this requirement could affect access, opportunities, and enrollments. For example, with more students seeking seats in art classes, will it be more difficult for freshmen to secure a spot in the foundations of art class? This is an important question because this prerequisite class is required for advanced electives in the arts. If freshmen are less able to access foundations of art, some of our students with passion in the art may, not, may find it more difficult to take the preferred classes in a timely manner. I would like to see this type of question addressed before adding a re an arts requirement. So for all of these reasons, I'm not right now comfortable voting for an arts requirement without a more holistic and careful discussion about requirements in general and without a more clear understanding of how the proposed requirement affects access to some of the required and more popular <coughs> art classes. I'd like to recommend that we refer this important topic to a subcommittee for further study and that the subcommittee work with teachers, students, and administrators for a full perspective on the issues. Is there anyone else who uh, wishes to we have lost the We've lost the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Troubling sign. Uh, could someone comment to fill the time while she, before she comes back? Ms. Kaufman. Okay, thank you. So um, I had the flu last time. I, I, I um, had nothing to do except what I ended up doing is watching the school committee meeting. It was great. It was a great four-hour meeting. Um, I, did, um, I did actually appreciate the fact, and, and, I, and I, I enjoyed the discussion, the debate about this. I, I did recognize that that was one of the few times in my short time on the school committee that we've had kind of intensive, and I thought, healthy debate. So I was happy to see that, and I know it takes time. I have already an hour and ten minutes or hour and 20 minutes, but I think it's worthwhile. So for my two cents, um, I did, very happy that Elena had the opportunity. Thank you for, for sharing that information. I thought that was extremely helpful. I, I did talk to a lot of people about this. Um, I don't think the, the decision around arts requirement is high stakes at all. I think the, the facts that are out there are, it's gonna impact only a few kids. Most kids take art. I don't think we're talking about high stakes, but I agree with almost, in fact, I think I agree with all the points that my colleague, Ms. Boss, is making. And so I was going to come with a, with a similar idea, and I'm glad she brought it up, which is something that got brought up a few times, I think, last week, which is this is an opportunity for us, I think, and, and I, I think it's a really healthy thing for a community to go through a process of looking at their graduation requirements on, on a some sort of basis, and I reached out to Mr. Lombardi and Mr. Provost. I don't think I got a concrete answer. Maybe there is one, but it would seem as it's been at least four or five years, and I think probably every five to ten years a community should do this, and um, last week's conversation just stimulated that. It's, it's not really have to do with art, but I got to thinking that, again, we don't offer some of the things that Mass Corps does, and I wonder why we don't offer foreign language, and I wonder if we're offering this, the right foreign languages, and I, I wonder if we shouldn't be offering foreign language at elementary rather than middle or high school, as an example. We also have talked a lot about your, um, the conference with Dr. Daggett, and, uh, Dr. Provost has brought up also, and we all know that the skills required for kids in the future are different. I've had an opportunity to look at 
and work with uh, other high schools around um, New England, and many of them, trust me, have many different requirements, several of which, whether it's you know community-based or career-based, they see and, and really require, I know it's a bad word, but they require kids to do something and demonstrate some learning or some interconnection between academics and, and careers, and they don't see it as a dichotomy, academic and career preparation. So all these things together, I mean, I, I thought it really would be a good opportunity, and, and I don't know if it's a subcommittee or a community-wide committee or the high school council or whether there's an existing committee that makes sense, but I thought it's because it's the art requirement really isn't a rush, I think we can wait a year. I think we can propose, we ask Dr. Provost or Mr. Lombardi to come back with an idea that maybe is a little bit more um, rich, and, and again, somebody else brought this up, so I'm repeating what somebody else said, but just an idea that we could have uh, a richer community-based conversation. I think the time for that is right. I think we can learn a lot by looking at what other districts are doing, and I think um, things are changing. Our society is changing, the economy is changing, the nature of the kids that we're teaching are changing, uh, kids' interests are changing, and we have a great opportunity to get input from from students, from us, from community members, from academics in our community and others, and we can take our time and incorporate whether art should be part of that requirement. And honestly, we might find that the community wants three or four or five arts requirements as a because this is Northampton, and we'd have to scale back to one, but at least we'll have that opportunity to discuss it. So that would be my I endorse Mrs. Ross Okay. Other, um, other I wonder if I could ask Mr. Sure. Lombardi a question. Sure, please. Um, so, so you you presented this proposal. Yeah. And you know it's obviously spurred a lot of discussion amongst ourselves. And um, I guess part of my assumption is that there was some discussion prior to this proposal coming forward. So, uh, could you share with us sort of what that process was, what that discussion was, and if it. And if that discussion considered a lot of these questions that we have been raising. Yeah, in terms of a review of our overall graduation requirements, no, and to the level that you're talking about in terms of, no. It, it was discussed that of taking a look at, um, you know, valuing art. You know, it's, it's, been, it's been tossed around here and there before, and then it was proposed to me by the department chair of the art department, um, gave the reasons why, um, and it is a valuable course. It, it does tie in a lot of things, as Molly even said, in terms of, you know, um, the, the connections for students and creativity. Um, it has a lot of crossover other curriculums. And so we brought up the department chair meeting and the department chair um, supported it as well. Um, we felt it was something important that we felt that our students should experience um, in terms of high school curriculum. I guess my other question would be. You know, I, I guess, um, we felt also that we have the capacity. Mean, there's, there's a lot of decisions that go into the courses you offer, and again, all the budget stuff today was a lot about, you know, what what can we afford to do or not do, um, and so hey, it would be it would be great to offer world language, but to offer you know a world language to have the, the variety of levels that you have from beginner to AP, you know, um, you're talking taking a look at budgets, you're talking tough decisions. You know, um, the feeling was by creating an art experience that is connecting performing arts, visual arts, um, technology as, as an aspect um, that we're already offering was a great way to encourage students to take it, um, but also has a lot of crossover appeal into this changing workforce, the changing world that we're, that we're doing. You look at our robotics, for example. Robotics is a great integration of technology, the sciences, as well as art. When those students go there to the, you know, the robotics competition, it is not just a robot. <coughs> there are themes, and they're, bring, they're drawing in the creativity from our artists. Uh, if you're taking a theater course, which counts as one of those, that's a great way for a student to get confidence in terms of public speaking, um, working together, collaboration. So these are all elements that are tied into the 21st century learning that we feel is just another form for students to engage in that capacity. Um, it would not be draining. We felt that, again, that's why we went wide with the um, requirement for course offerings so it wouldn't impact just the foundations. 
That's why you could take photography, you could take videography, you could take a theater course, you could take chorus, band, all those count that as that. So it wasn't specifically, you must all start through one entry point of foundations. And or the woodworking too, that's another option. Can I just so, clarify something you said? Just, uh, just um, <coughs> it came forward from the department, department chair, mm -hmm. and then you brought it and, to and, 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 her, and the teachers in the department, yes. Okay. But then did it go to all the department chairs? We brought it to the department chair, yeah, oh, department so chair then, meeting, yep. Yeah. So then the English department chair and the math, science, math, science, all those folks, it was also voted on by them as well? Yeah. Okay. All right, just want to clarify that I didn't quite understand that. Go ahead. Yeah, so then the <coughs> section, we don't have like a vote like yeah. this, yeah. You, you know, in a quorum. Not a roll call, call vote, no roll call vote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there, there was a support for it. That, yeah, there's, I think, an appreciation and a support for it and the value um, of what it does for our students. So the second part of my question is the other piece of this discussion that has, I think I said something about the four block thing. I think I say something about the four block thing almost every single year when there's some <laughs> proposal that comes on about curriculum and stuff because, because it does, it, it's, you know, it's, it stubs into a lot of things when kids are, as they figure out what they can do in the four years at the high school, the fact that they can only take, sometimes it's, it's not even eight classes because of two semester classes and it's, it's, um, it is a thing that people bump into pretty routinely. Um, is that a discussion that is ongoing, or is that one that has been put aside because we're doing a four-block thing? No, so we actually, we actually have, um, th through a grant, we have funding, we, which we have right now, is a schedule review committee. Um, we've done, we've, we've um, already done a survey with our, with our teachers, and we're putting together a committee of a variety of teachers, and uh, we're having a first meeting March 8th to talk about next steps to take a look at you know, what are the pros? There's a lot of positive things in schedule two. So, yeah, so it, it's so it's taking a look at what are the positives we have, what are our concerns, and then what are next steps um, as we review this this schedule, and where where could it go to the next point? Right. Um, and I guess the question is, could that can that discussion? Is there a way for that discussion to include? I don't know the school council or a it's, wider it's, a wider group than absolutely. I mean, it is just at a very very basic preliminary and I said that having the first meeting and then where that's going to go would, it would clearly involve other other layers dr. provost I, I just wanted to make this comment um, sort of looking to the future as a superintendent who has one school with a stalled schedule because it didn't sync up with contract negotiations we are getting ready for contract negotiations to begin very soon so yeah. could you try to sync up what if you make any recommendations for change with that as your deadline or else I, I, well i think there's there's so <laughs> as you know any schedule there's so many there's contracts and then there's taking a look at um there's funding so you know there, there's a, there's a lot with the schedule stuff so yeah i mean i i'm not sure i can rush it i know that you know our initial plan was that you know any type of schedule review and then looking at the contract and potential budget if anything was to change you're really talking two years from now not next so, school right year. so so what i'm saying is i don't want to rush it but i just want to bring to your consciousness that if you want it to change not four years from now but anytime less than four years from now yes. we probably need something that's ready to be discussed at the next negotiation which is Next year, yeah, presume. yeah, no. So, so that, yeah, so the, so the goal, the goal is the, the awareness is that next year's schedule is locked in. We're already doing. We have a program of studies, and we're scheduling now for ne for next year. Um, so, we're aware that any schedule change was going to happen. Whatever it would look like, whatever change would have to be, not only um, it would have to be around this time in many ways. Not only for the negotiation, but in terms of how we schedule classes. And do our program of studies, so we're we're aware of the timelines and all that. And I don't want to rush ahead. I don't want to get you know I don't want to get people nervous in the community, my teachers, the students. Mm -hmm. All I can say is there there is a review to look at that. I can't promise anything except for more. There's going to be a very earnest review um, to get feedback on again, what's working, what's not, what, what we like to change, what we want to keep, etc. Uh, Mr. Meyer, then and then Elena. So I'm going to vote for the change in the policy 
Um, recognizing that I think the discussion of the block schedule, um, as a teacher who teaches in a school with a block schedule, um, that that is um, limiting to a lot of students. The fact that AP courses are frequently full year, um, which leaves you awkwardly ending the school year with a few weeks left, um, which again doesn't really sync up. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm not going to go in the direction that has been suggested um, by Mr. Kaufman and Ms. Voss, simply because I think um, the block schedule has so much reliance interest invested in it that I think the chance that it will be modified within the next five years is practically nil. I mean, having, having sat through, I think, five or six years of school busing discussions, um, even though everyone said over and over and over again, administrators, superintendents, teachers, parents, <coughs> said, we, you, know, this is, you know, this is important, the American Academy of Pediatrics. We had pediatricians talking about their patients. Nothing ever happened because everyone was afraid of what would result from a change, and people were going to be inconvenienced. And so I think that, um, I think that it, it, it's good to have the examination, um, but, you know, but at the same time, as, as Dr. Provost has just pointed out, if the examination doesn't complete itself by November when we begin negotiations, then that means it's essentially moot until 2021. And I can't make any promises. No, no, I abs well, absolutely. I'm just, I'm just saying that's changing something. Changing something. I think the block schedule was 1994, six. I mean, it was, I mean, so we're talking about something that's now 24 years of of people invested in it, and I'm I'm just I, I want to make an I want to make an incremental change now, um, and require the arts. I'm taking into account that the the opinions seem to be. Um, generally split from the survey responses. Um, and even those people who were on the no side um, all acknowledged the value of the arts courses. Um, so I, I think it's, a, it's an incremental change. Um, everyone will not be happy with it, but I'm going to vote for it. Elena, you wanted to say something? In the yeah, day. just kind of bringing it back to the arts requirement. Um, I, I just I failed to mention um, this, this aspect of the surveys before, and I, I think so many students talked about it that it, I would be remiss to not bring it up. Um, Many students who said no talked about how much arts courses for them are a place for passionate students who want to be in that, that arts course. Um, and I think that speaks to a larger theme at Northampton High of a lot of kids really working to find places in their schedule of those courses that really interest them and more importantly are around a group of students who are also interested in them. So those advanced APs and honors to some extent get to that too, but also these arts courses. I know from my experience, some of my favorite courses have been where I'm with a group of students who are passionately motivated in that one, you know, arts or, or, or whatever um, subject. So I just think that whether or not that has any, any change on how people are seeing arts requirements, I think that's important to bring up because that was frequently something that students were saying to me. Um, I also think, and this might be a question for Mr. Lombardi, I completely understand this aspect of we, we want to show um, that we are committed to the arts. Um, but I guess what I've heard from students and, and in my conversations, I think a lot of people are still just a little confused as to what we're hoping to get out of requiring this, of, of getting those 20 or so odd students to take this course rather than, you know, this, this idea of aligning with Mass Corps and this idea of, of showing support for the arts. You know, I, th I think it goes to, again, you, you know, all of our courses that students take are the hope that students are leaving Northampton armed and skilled with a certain skill set, education, and I, and I think <coughs> it has to do with that, that we, that we believe that Northampton students, that the importance of art, the, the ability, what it can do for your education, what it can do for your growth, um, how you can apply it at the next level, that's what we value. We want our students to have that. We want them to have four Englishes. We want them to have, I mean, all those things. We say we want to review, you know, our, our requirements. It's at the hope that our students are leaving armed a certain way. And I think, you know, the people that brought art forward feel that, that should be something that's part of that. Our students are leaving armed, you know, with that. Ms. Foss? 
Um, I just um, wanted to respond about the block schedule because I hope I wasn't misunderstood. I think the block schedule has a lot of advantages. It's a very complicated conversation, and I don't want to conflate it with this. But where it connects with this is because of the block schedule, it makes it feel really unacceptable to me to add another requirement to these students right now. And partly it is because it takes them two of two essentially elective classes to take a lot of the different AP classes and it means there's a lot less choice and and I'm not saying the block schedule is bad or good and I don't even think it needs to be tied into the discussion right now about requirements but because we have a block schedule it makes it really feel like we already have a lot of requirements well you know and I think that you know I, I will add it you know what you said about you know Northampton High School being a, um, a lot of pressure you, you know um, it's funny, I, I've been at schools that I would say you could feel the pressure when you walked into the building. And I would say at times I don't feel like Northampton feels that way for a variety of reasons. And I think that's, and I'm not saying that pressure isn't there. But one of the things that we do, and we've had this conversation for, for a while, um, administrators and counselors, is you know, trying to, to arm students to give you the, the freedom, the permission, and the parents too, to choose things, you know, you know, electives. And so yes, and so I think that this might, I think, in, bring that encouragement more. I, th I think that's important. I think that there's plenty of, there are cho choices. If you want to take seven maths, you can. But I also see a lot of kids that may, you know, if a kid graduates and they never, and they got so focused on the APs and honors, that's all they did. And they're then part of that, that, that cycle of, of stress. Maybe it's important for the school to say that we think you should also try a class that is something else. That does have academic benefit. That does have, you know, an area for you to grow. I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop soon. But I, I think what you just said, though, really connects with me, and it's why I think Northampton is such a great high school. In that, some kids would rather take those seven math classes than other things. And I think in the end, that they get their personal choice, and they have these great guidance counselors that help them navigate. And the system's working because ninety percent of them are taking an arts class. And so they go in there and they think, you know, I have some autonomy here. I have control over this. I tried art and music at JFK, and here I am, and I can take what I'm passionate about. And I really, I really value that about our high school. And it's not because I don't value the arts, but that's the piece I value. Ms. Hennessy. I love this discussion. For me, it's really a philosophical question um, that s right now in our society, we're valuing math and science, and, and that's not bad. Um, but I think it's incumbent upon us to say there is more and before you graduate from high school at 18 we believe that you should be exposed to this and I actually think it should be more but I love mm -hmm. one and that it's a value thing it's about mm -hmm. the country you know we're saying you take this take this take this test and math and science and English and don't worry about civics and here we are and don't worry about um, arts and languages and yet that's what makes our life so rich. And we get the opportunity to say to students, um, you're gonna have some choice, but this is super important in the world. And in, you know, so for me, that's where I am. And yet I, I think this discussion is incredibly important. And I would say, you know, there is choice if you think of the range of course that you can take. It's not like you're saying you must take, you know, wellness. There's not much choice in that wellness. You're, everyone is taking wellness. You know, but in terms of we're saying you need to take a visual art, I mean, this is a pretty wide offering um, across the board. Um, so I think there is a lot of choice there. Oh, there's so many things that I'm thankful for, and I know that it's really late, and I'm sorry, but it is crazy that we're talking about this, and it just brings up so much, and I find that really, really compelling. And Elaine, I really thank you for doing the survey. What came out for me from that survey um, was actually that I feel like there's brain science that we aren't teaching in wellness, um, and that there's a, there's a piece of uncomfortableness um, that was expressed that I really understand from those students who don't want this to be a requirement. And I talked about how much I don't, you know, I struggle with requirements as well. Um, I am really struck by, we talked about biases, my own bias in this conversation. Um, and I'm really trying to 
step outside of um, the investment that I have just as a human being in the situation. And, um, and the investment that the students seem to have in this because really they are told what to do. And it's ironic to me that they're not, that when they say I don't want to be told to take an art class, that there's not an external recognition that they're being asked or required to take math, <laughs> history, you know, that, they're, that these are external things that have been put on them and that it's hard when we're added something new. Saying all of that, I have to step outside of my bias, which is to, um, and this has been a big conversation this year, you know, listening to the teachers. And I feel that if the teachers came and presented, as you sort of clarified for me, this to all of the heads of department, that they must know something and that they understand this. Um, and I do feel that the students were, you know, pretty, like, it was pretty even. I don't, I, I, I feel like that was incredibly powerful information. Um, and I think that every educator should read that to really think about what our kids are thinking about and what we want to help them learn about why we take a range of things or, you know, even, I, this is a big conversation that we have about in elementary school, you are in a classroom with lots of different kids. You don't, you know, and that uncomfortableness is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So for all of that, I'm stepping out of my bias though, and I think I'm going to have to listen to the teachers. Um, and what Anne said, I think that our, our community values this. And I think by saying, yes, we will have, I would vote for having this requirement for those two reasons. And um, to the students who feel frustrated, I am I'm really sorry. Ms. Fallon, and then Ms. Busanski. Um, so I, I, I really try not to ever bring my children's experience into this, but it was something that was in the back of my mind when we were talking about this, <coughs> I don't think anyone's addressed, is the question of why, why are there students who aren't taking? Mm -hmm. And that's what I had hoped this would kind of bring to light and maybe address was, for instance, my child very much wanted to take the most, the one thing she was most excited about taking was one of these arts classes at the high school. And she wasn't able to get into it because of demand. And so what I had seen by making it a requirement was making sure that we had adequate staffing and adequate offerings for something because it was a requirement rather than having 10% of students try to get into that class that really you know, inspired them for, for a couple semesters in a row and not getting it and then not having space in their schedule because there are only so many times you can go to your guidance counselor and say, well, I didn't, I didn't get what I wanted and I didn't get this. And so that was what I was thinking of it as in was actually guaranteeing those students who desperately want to take arts the availability of the class because by virtue of it being a requirement, then we'll make sure that we have adequate staffing and adequate course offerings. So I don't know if that's yeah. the, the case or if that's just the most popular off offering. Yeah, I'd have to have more information. So <laughs> no, but I don't know how often that's happening. About your We've child. We've talked about that 10% that's not oh, taking I think the class. A, I th if, it's, if it's because they didn't get into the class that did interest them and excite them. Yeah, my, my sense, you know, when I showed the names to, to guidance counselors, because I did run that, it, it, it ran the gamut. Some kids are self-selecting not to. Right. You know, um, they, they couldn't really give, I guess, a, a real specific but reason. Are, are there, do you typically have arts classes that are full to capacity that you have? Our foundations, you know, get, get up there. But then as you get to the, net, to the other layers, um, they tend to be smaller. Cera ceramics mm -hmm. can be up there, but, you know, the honors um, levels classes, there's definitely room, room in there. Um, our woodworking are def is definitely popular. Videography, photography are popular. But would you have a student, if you were having a requirement and it was something that wasn't in their area of interest, they were more into math or AP, would they jump right into an honors level arts class? Or no, would they no, take, no. Right, and so, so while you're saying those are smaller, I'm saying these kind of exploratory classes for I'm interested, I'm going to try one art, they do tend to be bigger classes I think or fill up. We're comfortable that we, we, it, would, it would work. 
No, I, okay. I, I guess I'm, I might I guess my <laughs> point is, is maybe that's, that's why I would support it, is oh. because by making it a requirement, you are then committing yes. resources to making sure that you have those classes yep. available to all students and you don't just say, sorry, it wasn't available. Exactly, yes. Okay. Can, can, I, can I clarify that? Is that okay? Uh, sure. Because I, I talked to you about this and this was exactly what my concern was and I'm not sure how it works. This is exactly what the kind of question I wanted to understand. So a student takes foundations of art in order to take several more advanced classes, mm -hmm. right? It's a prerequisite for a bunch of art classes. So mm -hmm. now if you're a freshman, but now there's a bunch of juniors and seniors who need to fulfill their art requirement and they want to take foundations of art or foundations of art meets at the period that their AP classes doesn't meet at, all of a sudden we have people not typically taking foundations of art um, as freshmen taking it and the freshmen don't get the spot and that's that's a big picture concern that I was trying to articulate because then those freshmen who don't take foundations of art can't go on and take ceramics or advanced painting or whatever the next thing was until maybe they're a junior because they had to wait to take it. Um, I, I, I did not hear in the conversation we had offline that um, there would be extra sections of foundations of art. I heard we'd fill the empty spots we're, we're, in the classes. But all of our know. sections, we're always, every year when we do, when we do course registration, that determines what we have the next year um, for cor course offerings. Um, and at times, you know, sometimes schedules don't work out for kids. They have to make choices for a variety of things. It could be courses or, you know, there's more students have signed up for it, or they've also taken some singleton classes or some full year APs, and just how the grid works out. All those things are influential of what a student can and can't take. Um, but there's also other options too, you, you know, and, and sometimes students ha have to make choices. They have their first choice and they have their second choice. And, that, and that, that happens for all, all courses that we offer. So I, I think that, that concern is something that students deal with in many other subjects as well. Ms. Busansky? Um, well, I guess I just want to go back to what Ms. Voss and Mr. Kaufman were saying more towards the beginning of this discussion. And what I was hearing really was that um, was a request to look at this in sort of a, in a more holistic fashion, which I'm all for. And I think I said that at the last meeting. So I really agree that we should be looking at requirements in a holistic fashion and not just at, before we even get to the point of discussing or voting on adding an arts requirement. Having said that, my second point is really minor, which is just a request that we could add creative writing to the list of acceptable <laughs> arts classes if an arts requirement were to pass. That's my second point, which I guess would be designated in the program of studies, so that would sort of be under your purview. It would so. be something I would have to have a discussion with. Yeah, yeah taken. but I feel like that falls under this de designation of an arts requirement. We were talking about Ms. Burnham, the artist, just last, at that last meeting, so if we're going to be expansive in our definition, that's all. Mr. Kaufman. So I'm, I'm just real curious. I mean, I think we, we brought up, <coughs> just to reiterate, I, I, I don't feel I have strong feelings on this. I mean, both, both sides make a lot of point. I just think this is a really small stakes decision. I think it's a lost, to my mind, it's a lost opportunity not to take advantage of, the, of looking at this. And I embrace the idea of looking, of fitting this into a broader discussion. My sense is the time is right to do that, and I'm just curious whether I'm, whether what, what your instinct is, whether this is a time to have a, you know, within the next year or two, a broader discussion on our graduation requirements, and, and the same for you, Ms. Lombardi, and, and how your staff would feel. I don't know. I know. I, that's, I, well, I think you, you know. I, I'm not sure. I guess I'd be under, I, I'm trying to understand what you're looking for because, in some ways, our graduation requirements are, you know, for for example. You know, we, we follow the, the standards for um, state college level acceptance. You know, and so in terms of uh, the layer they look for, so that really guides. There's that, there's that layer of influence in terms of how many maps, English, histories, etc. There's the state level, which requires a phys ed, which we have the phys ed, the wellness requirement, um, as well as the U.S. history. Um, so I guess in some ways it'd be interesting because we don't really select courses. You know, it's more the, the, the number that they're asking for. So, so I, I don't think like we would, um, we wouldn't change or lower what's already there. Well, well we might. That's the thing. <coughs> we might. We might decide as a community and based on input from you and your and your staff and research and looking into other groups and getting perspectives from a variety of folks that we might find soup to nuts. I don't even know what we're allowed to do. But if there's just just hypothetically, I wouldn't endorse this. But if there's just six courses that are required. 
you know, the, the four wellness in U.S. history, and is that it? From the state. State? So, because I'm just giving okay. examples of right, how some things are right. kind of locked in. Yeah. And are you looking, are you thinking it's requirements like specific courses, or are you thinking it's in subject areas? Because the, the ones that we have are, yeah. are based on a minimum for a college acceptance. So we wouldn't go below, we would, we would never say, or we wouldn't recommend, I can't see anyone at the high school recommending, yeah, let's lower one of the math. Yeah. Let's I lower an English, right. because that, that is a, a bare minimum to get into a state university which then is accepted by the private universities. Um, we probably, um, we wouldn't take the, the U.S. history off because that's required by the state or the, um, the wellness. So I'm not, I'm not sure if, there's a, if you, it would be to, to look at adding more requirements. I would say that I don't have the answers. I would say we currently don't match Mass Corps. We don't match UMass. We don't do either of those things. So we already have made some choices to differentiate. And as a community, um, like I, I just think that the nature of what kids need to learn in the future, I think the skills and the interest of our teachers, I think the voice of our teachers is really important. I agree with Molly that at this point, rather than ad hoc, let's add this world history class or let's add this or let's that, it seems like every now and then it's a good idea to reflect on what we're doing and maybe it'll turn out to be all classes are required or minimal classes are required. I don't know, but the status quo to me, feels like should be revisited every few years. I don't have a specific idea. I guess I'm just floating the notion of, is this an opportunity to take into account some of the issues that we've raised um, and maybe come up with another idea about, around graduation requirements? And maybe that will lead into a discussion around, we can only do this if we change the semester or if we add more courses or we switch things around. It would not be an easy decision, but that's why I pose it as a long-term sort of one. But I don't have a specific answer. I don't know if that helps. Kind of, you guys are trying to get some direct. So, yeah, so okay. I, guess, I guess I would answer the question on two levels. Yeah. Um, so one is just kind of this um, almost uh, trite parliamentary level, which is it's not on the agenda. So I don't think we can discuss doing that at this time. The second, I think, sort of more substantive response is, is I've been thinking about your question, the one time sort of in the life cycle of a high school yeah. when that might come up is when we're involved with self-study for NEASC, um, presuming we're going to continue to do that. I know that's also a controversial issue and, and needs to be discussed as well. But that's the time when um, all departments go basically back to the beginning and mm -hmm. say, is what we're doing still in line with the standards? Is what we're doing still sensible? I don't know when that is for the high school. Um, we're actually year five now, so I th and they, they moved it, so I think it's t um, 2022. So maybe that's not the best time, but to answer your question, in my knowledge of high schools, that would seem like the time when that conversation most naturally occurs. Well, I will be the trite parliamentarian. <laughs> that's my job as the chair. And just say we do have a motion on the table uh, to no, 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 but I'm just saying, right? <laughs> we have a motion to approve this uh, policy change, and obviously if, if it fails, then that's a, that's a discussion, then that's a, a sense of the committee that it needs to go back <coughs> to the drawing board. So I feel like we should just vote on the policy tonight, and then we'll see what happens from there. So there's been a motion made by Ms. Fallon. Uh, it was seconded by Ms. Hennessy. Ms. Um, do people, are people okay to vote? And then we'll go from there. Um, I sense it'll be somewhat complicated, so I'm going to ask for a roll call vote, like it was last time. We split our votes. No. <laughs> <laughs> no vote splitting. Yes. Help me understand. What are we voting? We're voting to <laughs> to add the requirement. Uh, to change the yes, policy. Will be oh, add the policy. To add the requirement, a vote against will be against uh, adding the requirement. Yeah, I'm going to say no. Yes. 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 Okay, so by a, uh, by a vote of eight to two, the uh, revised policy IKF is adopted, um, and uh, that, that completes the reading on that. Um, 
So we do have future business and meeting dates. The school committee meeting of March 8, 2018, 7.15 p.m., JFK Community Room. Uh, the Rules and Policy Subcommittee will meet March 14, 2018 at 3.30 p.m. in the Superintendent's Office. And the School Committee meeting of March 22, 2018 is scheduled for 7.15 p.m. in the JFK Community Room. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed. Uh, the School Committee meeting is... <sighs>